Okay, I'm live. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be funny. Okay, so yeah, welcome everybody to Python Pizza Hamburg 2023. This is the fourth time. So we did it in 2019 at Zinarun Schrader, and then we did it online a couple of times, also on New Year's Eve during COVID, so that we help people not go out partying while the pandemic was really high to stay and watch Python talks. And yeah, and now we are back in person and we are doing it hybrid so anybody can join. So I think there's some people around the world joining. So let's start. So the plan for the QR, yeah, I don't know what, there's a QR code. You can scan it and be surprised, but what's behind the QR code? So for the online people and anybody like who feels all of a sudden that you get you don't feel so well, you can always go home and watch the stream. Um, the links are posted. And I'm not sure if you need a chair. Maybe I need a chair. There's the chair. Okay, cool. I have a chair. Okay. The chair is so we don't move the cameras in front of here. Okay. Um, you can chat with other attendees on Discord. Um, you all received, especially the people that bought the tickets long ago, link to Discord. Um, if you did not receive it, this is the link. You can join on Discord. Maybe people from the audience might have questions for you afterwards or want to mingle with you. And then for the other people that are here, networking, of course, during breaks. And now, um, yeah, you can use this hashtag to share on social media. We are on Twitter, on Mastodon, and on LinkedIn. Um, some of you found us through one of these channels. So please do use this hashtag for this year. And don't forget to brag to everybody how much fun you're having today. OK. Um, and if you're online, of course, we are not ordering pizza for you. So please do feel free to eat pizza or whatever you want to eat. You can also eat salad. It's good for digestion. OK, but today here in person, we get pizza from Ace Pizza, which is a nice place in Hamburg, recommended by Italians, so it can't be wrong. But OK, so here's the organizers behind today's event. So we have Anna Marie. She's going to be remote. Christian, you've already met him because he gave you your stickers and uh, your name tag jessica she's doing the streaming today and me okay so the agenda we have awesome talks we have a break then we have awesome talks again then we have pizza break which is a little bit longer then then we have awesome talks again and then we have another break followed by awesome talks that's right and at the end we have closing and whoever is now inspired about all this awesome talks that they have seen and they're like really feeling that they want to, you know, take the stage and take the opportunity, we have lightning talks where you can present whatever you want or upcoming conferences that you're involved in or things that you want to be part of. Okay, tomorrow, in case you are not aware, in Hamburg, there is a conference called Rehearsal. It is a training conference aimed for helping people from underrepresented groups in Tesh to get better at public speaking. And if you want a free ticket, scan this code, enter the raffle, especially if you're from an underrepresented group in Tesh, and uh, win a free ticket. If you're not from an underrepresented group in Tesh, please buy a ticket, support the people who need support. Okay, we have code of conduct, of course. Um, Python Pizza is dedicated to providing a harassment-free conference experience for everyone. So we do not tolerate harassment um, of conference participants in any form. And if you if you're, please go to the website to see the whole code of conduct. And if you have anything to report, you can reach out to any of the organizers you've seen earlier, or you write us an email. Okay, and yes, we are going to take pictures. If anybody <laughs> feels like you don't want to, we are going to share the pictures, the link to the drive with the pictures. And if anybody says, hey, I don't want to be in that picture, let us know uh, via the email. Otherwise, we will have them 
published at some point. Not very like, you know, hey, these are nice shoes of a person that was at Python Pizza and you should buy those shoes kind of pictures, right? So just uh, Python Pizza was awesome kind of pictures. Okay, these are all sponsors that made all of this possible, right? We have new work where we are today. Hope you're all enjoying the nice uh, neighborhood and the location. Um, you can see Michael there in the audience and you can ask him anything about the work. Um, then we also have the Python Software Verband, who is uh, the legal entity behind the conference. Otherwise, it's really complicated in Germany to do anything, you know, bureaucracy. And you need to, yeah, I mean, okay. Then we have the Python Software Foundation. They are sponsoring the pizza. And EuroPython, they are sponsoring the travel grants that some of the people got to get here. Then we have PyLadies Hamburg, PyLadies Berlin, Ace Pizza delivering pizza at 12.30, I heard. And Honeypot, you have also Honeypot here you can like reach out to and you got like swag outside and you know, ask a lot of questions. Rehearsal, the conference tomorrow and any scale. The books are like somewhere in Seoul as usual. And um, we will, for people who want the learning ray book, we will have to reorganize how you get those books. <laughs> Okay, so Pi ladies, um, thank you to, so the proceedings of this conference are going to Pi ladies. We are not making, we are not profiting from the conference, right? So thank you for donating um, by buying tickets and um, to the Pi ladies chapters in Germany. We have Pi ladies Berlin, who's doing regular meetups. So who here is from Pi ladies Berlin? Raise your hand. Yay. So a lot of Pi ladies Berlin, Berlin's here and, um, there's a lot of events, regular meetups twice a year, and um, yeah, you can reach out, you can follow. And Pilot is Hamburg. Yay, some people here from Pilot is Hamburg, yeah, really good. And the same we do, we, well, we used to do regular meetups, now we, are, we have to start doing regular meetups again. We had a nice meetup yesterday with Serena, and we're gonna continue. And there's Pilot is Munich, where you can also check them out on the Meetup and on Slack and on LinkedIn. And there's also PyLady Sudvest. Yes, anybody here from PyLady Sudvest? At least kind of, right? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so get involved, right? So if you wanna get involved with PyLadies, you can give a talk, a workshop, you can organize a meet, help organize a Meetup. If you work on, in a really cool office, you can say, hey, we would like to host you. Reach out. Um, that's a really nice way to you know, get involved and, uh, or become an organizer. OK, um, just one thing. The dog that is walking around is called Brutus. Do not give him anything to eat, no matter how unfed he may look at you. Yeah, <laughs> that's a strategy. Ignore it. OK. So thank you for making Python Pizza Hamburg possible. And that was, I was really quick, right? That's the last slide. So we start in 10 minutes with the keynote. In the meantime, if anybody forgot that they wanted to go to the toilet, that's the moment.
Okay, so while we're getting ready for the keynote, and um, we, uh, we have a story. I mean, Python Pizza is very famous for its stories, right? Yes. So today's story is about a little boy. So this little boy lived in a land far away, just like Hamburg. Who here has traveled from far, far away to get here today? Or felt like they're traveling from far, far away? Far away. Far away. Far it felt, away. yeah, very good. So yeah, so a land far, far away and he close to, to his home, there was a mountain. And on top of this mountain, there's like a monastery, right? Has anybody here lived close to a monastery ever? Okay, so on this, in this monastery, but nobody went there because, you know, they didn't know where the monastery is or how to get there in anyway. So sometimes the little boy was riding his tricycle. Who here has a tricycle at home? For, so one person. Currently, yes. Okay, so tricycle, you all know what it is. That's very good. So one day this little boy was, I don't know where Paloma is. Oh yeah, she's here. Okay, so one minute. So while Paloma is setting up to come here, you know, um, so he was riding his tricycle and there was a very strong wind blowing just like in yeah. Hamburg. Yeah, exactly. We have like the land of winds here. So a strong wind. And then there was the sound coming from the monastery carried on this wind. And he was really wondering what that is. But we would find out what that is after the keynote. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being awake this early in the morning in this very cold day. <laughs> um, yeah, good. Oh. I'm very unquiet to say sit. Um, thank you. I do appreciate and thank a lot the organization for allowing me to share this because this is my super dear project is a project that is probably <laughs> the thing that i'm most proud i ever done in my life that big um and it is a fellowship program and what i wanted to share it is um i can talk about that for probably six months straight and i try to organize the first time that i speak publicly about it and i try to set it up in a way that makes sense for you to give you all like implement a little seed in everyone for you to bring that to your own company to your own spaces and replicate it it's meant to be a replicated space what do you want me to do okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ta and my name is paloma Oliveira. i am currently a growth engineer and a full in fossil free and open source software advocate I work in a company called Sauce Labs, and I'm very thankful because Sauce did allow me to experience, and they gave me the go ahead, try it out, this idea of this project that I'm about to share. Um, yes. And this is what I'll be talking about in a very brief uh, takes. Why should I implement the seed on you that you need a fellowship program? What was the great expectations when I was idealizing the program? What was the realities? The, a lot of challenges that I faced in between that you would probably face it if you want to implement one. So learning from failures and the main takeaways or how can you create a fellowship to call your own? But why the hell do we even need a fellowship program? Um, for me, though, this was very fundamental. I am a career changer. I was, n I never grown thinking my dream is to become a growth engineer, nor an advocate because I did not even know what it was. And that came mostly because of PyLadies. Thank you for them to implement that on me. And um, this program was a way for me to understand from my own experience what was the challenges for me to put the feet in the industry. And, uh -huh. but most importantly, because I do advocate a lot for free and open source software or open source mm -hmm. and for women in tech or the gigantic uh, lack of diversity that we have in tech that is even bigger in open source, I know that 
it is up to us and every single one of us to make the difference to correct the systemic issues that we have. So this is where I came up uh, with this fellowship program. <laughs> and those were the things that took me to create this program. So giving the people the opportunity to have a chance to start when you don't know where to start, even if you're in a school and you have been trained to be in the industry, it's pretty hard for you to think, will someone ever give me the illuminated uh, experience and place to get started? It's quite hard. And if you come from another country, if you come from another uh, industry, that can get like a really long, distant, far away approach. The other part is that when I got to get in the industry, I was like, oh my God, there's not just front and back end. There's this amazing sort of stuff that makes software industry in general that no one ever told me about. I was like, oh, can I try it out? And if no one hires for that or gives you the opportunity, how will you even know that? Um, I'm very involved with either the IS as uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and sustainability. Those are usually groups that companies set up and uh, mostly for women in tech. And 99% of the people, if you ask them what they need, they will tell you, I want to be part of a mentorship program or I want to become a mentor. This is does anyone here ever thought about that or has that wish to become a mentor, to teach someone? Have you ever, could you ever experience that and actually be a mentor? Do you ever have this opportunity? Cool. Sometimes we don't, and, but that's the wish, right? We want to have all this learning that we have, that we grow, and we want to share with others. And this makes us feel valued. That was also part of my um, experience when I became a mentor and I was like oh my god I actually know those stuff I thought I was so silly but I actually know give us the sense of belonging um, the other part was of course the curiosity to explore like oh really what do you do with machine learning what do you do with the uh, marketing what do you do in the product what is that very curious to understand the whole thing that make that thing that is not just not just code my personal experience in my company that I see a lot of people was also suffering from a lot of silence. So we do the same thing, but the vision or perspective from one thing that we call software changes so much if you go for another team. And putting that perspective together, I think it has a great value mostly for the one we should be worried about, which is the end user. And the lack of sense of belonging. If you're in a company that you don't have those opportunities and you're just stick to your backlog, you probably feel like, uh, oh, there's not much here I can do. So th this is what is behind. It's just painting the scene of how did I came up with this. And I had, those were my uh, inspirations. And I really want to give a big shout out. One was um, um, one of the ways that I thought, well, maybe I can put my feet in the industry was in a program called Real Girl Summer of Code that was canceled. And then Jessica stepped in and she said, you're not losing that. And she created out of nothing a program in Ecosia called Ecosia Summer of Code that gave me the opportunity to feel how it was it like to be in a company. That's super powerful and that changed everything for me. And there's other programs that kind of do the same, but I had my, my critiques about it. Or they were short or they were super competitive and they were expecting me to be in a triangle that I had to be the best, which is like, oh my God, that's like the most awful and prejudicial kind of thinking we put in this world because it is this pyramid that you never reach. It's patriarchy capitalism, but not let's not go there now. Um, but it's bad. It doesn't give actually the opportunity for people. It's just for a few ones. So what was my expectations with this program? It was basically having this, like, let's see, I will give these people the chance to get a fit in the industry. People who should, would most pro probably not likely have the chance at all to be there. I want the, the people, the students, they are in the back. The one that no one pays attention and they think they will just become a drug dealers and die in poverty. I want those, those people, the people would never give a chance. So I have to reach out to those people and find them and make them want to be part of this program. The second one was um, I want them to understand the software should first see the user. That's the one we're creating for. It's not for just uh, creating unsustainable things that do no good to no one, but to your own probably, uh, I don't know, curiosity, which is okay, it's good. But 
when we're creating something with so much effort, I want to have this to have a more holistic approach. I want them to think how it's going to be maintained, for who is this, how can it grow, how can it be shared, the most value of collaboration based on open source. I want them the freedom to try it out different paths, especially if they're starting their career. I want them to be able to experience whatever their curiosity bring them. This is a lot of with my open source experience. If someone, someone has ever, has someone ever collaborated with open source and had this experience to work synchronously and choosing what you want, great. That's what I wanted to tell them and give them the opportunity to feel that. And now, of course, getting a chance to put their feet in, having the value of say, you have this, um, this test of quality, you're good to go, and I hope you leave from here and have an awesome job, whatever you look for. Of course, fostering the maintainers of tomorrow and understanding the importance of open source for the industry and for them to feel they can do whatever they want way more than the backlog and feeling belonging. This was my expectations of it. And those were my fellows. Uh, I selected them. Um, um, just a brief what I did. They were, I called them tech enthusiasts. And my open call, what I did was saying, I specify five different roles. I had the approval to have five fellows for six months. And I scoped them a project that was um, thrown away in my company. They didn't know, they had no one, no project, no engineer, no one to take care of this project. And a really fast scope. It was, um, Mailing list is a website that sends opinionated tips about testing with a specific software called Selenium. And it was unupdated for five years, although we bought for a great amount of money and no one taking care. So what I said was like, give it to me, let me open source it. And I do that with the help of fellows. This was the task scoped, scoped task. And I invited people like, hey, I need a designer. I need a quality assurance. I need a front end, a back end, and someone from content. And these people apply to it, most of them wanting to be probably front-end engineers, um, except to Django um, in the middle, that uh, uh, they are a designer by formation and has always been their passion, although very close to open design. But what was the reality <laughs> of that? Um, the reality is that I had to first pitch it for one year to my CEOs and executive levels um, for them to approve the program and give me a budget. And that means that was not my experience as Paloma anymore, wanting to have my feet in the industry and wanting to learn. Um, so there is different stakeholder expectations that I need to learn. And this is, if you want to do your project, that's the first thing to have in mind. It's not just about you and your wish and the wish of the people learning, but the people who are paying for it and they probably want to take some advantage, especially with a for-profit company from marketing, you will probably have to set up uh, those expectations as well. Um, so learning to speak those different languages. Setting up metrics from the beginning would be the second one. I didn't do that, had not a clue how to do that. What I did was I had a big spreadsheet with a curriculum of things that I wanted them to learn. And there is a big, big difference between when you're, um, ex when you're interested in, in making those people learn. So when you have a curriculum, the things they have to learn from what is onboarding and preparing them to get their feet in the industry. It's not a school, it's different. You would really deal with a lot of tools, you have to different sorts of information that people do not learn in school versus a product. You promise to deliver a product and that's part of scoping something. But those are different. And if you're the only person doing that, you will need to ask for help. And if you don't know how to ask for help, you're probably do something you're going to lose there tremendously. <clears throat> the other part is when I had too much freedom, like, OK, it's great to be due by your curiosity. But if you're not guided, especially if you're new to the industry, there's too much freedom will make you just don't do anything. You got so lost that you don't know where to start. And not promoting enough and not documenting enough will make that never happen. <laughs> and that's sad. It's like, if you don't have the picture, it never happened. Have you heard that before? It's a little bit like this. If you do not document it, you don't create the resilience for you to look back and say, oh my God, there was a lot of work that I actually did. You will not even remember. So document that little by little is quite important. Um, 
I wanted to open a few of those. I'm not quite sure how can I open them to show you a little bit to be less. Uh, Mm. I'll try to open up so you can have a little bit of more. Okay. Actually, if I refresh now because I added two slides. And I have to do the escape. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Okay. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think I would not be able to share everything because they are kind of little close. But one of the things as a takeaway that I learned from that, and it is really a short time to tell you um, in detail. Ah, I lose my notes. Um, but those would be a little bit of takeaways for you if you want to get started and do something similar. Um, talking by numbers, I did base on the outreach program, which is the most respected one, mo most known. So a few things. First, it's called uh, fellowship is not internship because that affects your company budget a lot. If you say I want an internship, they need to budget for one year and hiring a person. If it's a fellowship, by law, this is a scope for something you don't need to hire. For the fellows, is not that great but they have six months of experience and it's more real for a company. And uh, that not Richie, that's about uh, 2,500 euros a month, which is uh, in Europe, it's still a pretty good uh, uh, salary for an intern to get started. In the US where I had to hire them, that's not even a minimum wage. So if you wanna do something global, there are some things to keep in mind, um, but it's still, pretty good for you. It's like a free money. You don't, you have no much attachment to it. You just need, really have to set up expectations with people you're contracting. It's more like a contractor, but just to say a little bureaucratic and legal things behind it. But you can step it and say a very close, I need 69,000 euros for six months. That's pretty much not much for a company, especially if you go to marketing departments and you ask for that. And that is the money that will probably change the life of five people. And this is why I like to talk about this project, because it's very impactful for a lot of people, for the company as well, because we saved a product while it, it, it's not much for a company to support that. And the value you can get for this is super, super high impactful. But I would say some things. One, you need a scope because that will be your guideline and your start, how you will pitch it and how you'll be able to take it further. In my, in my case, it was, let me save this product that is abandoned for 6, 9K, I will save that and you have no more issues, but scope it in a way that stakeholders have their expectations. The product people want me to take ownership and go to marketing. It's not possible for me to be the product leader the person, the, the mentor that is planning a curriculum and also the one, there was three things that was stuck at, I kind of forgot the third, but it was like a bit too much to be alone. So make sure for stakeholders you say, if I'm alone to do that, something will fail and it's probably that's the product maintenance or for me, the most important is the learning of those people. And, but finding the lies that will help you push forward and in my case, the mentors were the, uh, the people from the company. And that's where the sense of belonging started. Those people that were begging to become mentors, they were, had the opportunity to become mentors. And then I had the opportunity to do directly with my director engineer, the person from marketing, the person from customer success that they never thought um, they could talk to each other. And then they were talking and creating this program and changing the, and changing the view of software development in general because they were finally talking to each other. If you set up the metrics for each step and reevaluate with step with your stakeholders, you also make sure you're giving one step at a time. It's like I go to the product, the product I promise you to update it into here. We got that further. Shall we continue it? Would you prefer me to go somewhere else? So making those checklists month by month probably is great. Um, having the tools and communication and documentation look silly, but we were we lose a lot of times um, setting up these tools and how we will do that. 
documenting a shared step and making sure you end it in a way that you survey. And I say that because for me, the most learning came from um, doing a survey that for me to validate my expectations. And for me, one of the most important things was for people that I was working with um, for them to feel like they belong to the company more because they became mentors and they saw the impact on the life of those five people changing their lives. And for them, that was quite uh, one of the bonus of the program. And I scope it in a way that it would not take more than two hours a week of them. So it's nothing. It's not like a no one could complain. They're not doing their jobs because they're becoming mentors suddenly. It's two hours. It's less than they used to the uh, Instagram for sure. So it's really, really nothing. And by the side of the, the holistic experience, though, that was a crazy one. Um, my idea was for them to create um, common language. I'm a designer, content, uh, coder. So I structured in a way that the first part was a learning time and we had to speak the same language but that became a lot of schoolish. And then they are like, you're such a bad teacher. Like, a, damn it. <laughs> like, a, yes, we're not here to be teachers. Then I had to change the approach and went to the development phase. And that was quite good. So not standing, I'm teaching too much with the wish to teach. They have to be hands-on. And this is where they learn the most. But then they tend to be more specific and forget a little bit about the holistic part. But in a survey, um, it was really impressed that they said, well, it really helped me to understand software way beyond what I was used to and le learn collaborative. Um, we work actually together. We're not uh, isolated. Them as a designer thinking, oh, they don't get it. Or the, uh, the coder, the classic uh, conflict code design um, thinking, oh, they how they think they can do that it's impossible so making them talk all the time was quite helpful and for me the greatest experience was seeing um janek on the right um she came saying i'm a really good front tender i love that one month after starting the program she's like i hate that shit. i don't want to code again i really really hate it but she is a brilliant communicator and now she has she she leads her own community called Black Tech Denver in Denver, mm -hmm. and she became the best uh, developer advocate slash community leader I ever met. And that was done through she finding out her potential through the fellowship program. Uh, Regine uh, in the bottom down, she's, she's really a back end engineer. She loves it, but she got a chance to really understand how to talk to a designer, how to communicate better. That's quite hard for her. And Django is a full in um, designer, but uh, working openly and communicate very well with designers. Esther, brilliant content. She comes from writing and she never thought that could be an experience. And now she's actually applying for job, really well paid jobs where she, she can express herself. So that was for me the biggest adventure. And Danielle got a job in, in the middle of the program and she's a really, really good front end and product. I think she's a project manager now and all came from this experience of the <coughs> having a chance to try it out so those are my key takeaways i think uh, my time is over it was way too fast but this is a qr code you can schedule a one-on-one with me or just to talk either about open source or how to create your own fellowship program there's a lot of learning there and i would really love to see this program um, uh, being replicated and seeing the life of people's have been sponsored changed. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Paloma. Well, we're getting ready for the next speaker. As you remember, the wind was blowing and the sound was very strange and he didn't know where the sound was coming from or what the sound was about. Um, and was very curious. Who here considers themselves a curious person? There is a very good skill to have. It brings you really much forward in life and at work and everywhere. So develop that. So what does he do? He, he gets his tricycle and he decides to go on top of the mountain and 
see how this works. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't download it, but organize. We shall download it. Wait a second. It's a PDF, but then I have to present it for opening Google Docs. No, I didn't want to do that. Anyway, so he goes up the mountain. This is going to be. And he goes to the. Um, he goes to the thing, which is where the sound is coming from. Hmm? Which one? This? No. Three dots, three dots yeah. yeah. The fifth one. I downloaded, okay. And then it's downloaded, and then I have to open it. And now it's here. And this, now what? <laughs> yeah, most likely. Okay, so he goes to the mountain, and then it would be nice. Okay, so I have looks like I'm open it in preview. I have to bring it to all to the right side, and I also have to reshare it for Jessica in a second. This one has to go escape. He goes to the mountain and anyway, it takes like, how long do you think it took him to get all the way to the mountain? <laughs> I mean, like up the mountain with a tricycle. What do you think? Two hours. Two hours. Yeah, maybe. Who, anybody thinks longer than two hours? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the mountain is a tricycle, yeah, so... Okay, so this will be an equation because uh, let's say the it takes four hours this time with the tricycle. So at the end of the day, we will be able to calculate how high the mountain is. So far, we'll get in a second to what happens on the mountain. Thank you. You're not, I'm not sharing, but I shared it. Window, share. Not working? Share. I mean, never use PDFs, I guess. <laughs> mm. She'll refresh this. Now it's working. A professional professional slide manager okay so we made it i have to stay here right the microphone right okay so today i want to talk about streamlit and uh, mostly why i think is important if you know python if you're a data scientist and uh, i had a chance to use it during the last eight months uh, i found it really interesting now streamlit is actually part of snowflake so you can have a feeling of how much important this tool here is right now. And um, and they have to do this, I guess. Okay, working. So my name is Alessandro and uh, I'm from Italy. I work as a data scientist. And uh, as you can imagine, I'm here mostly because we're going to have pizza for lunch. Then I just leave. Very happy about that. Um, I'm basically working at Kinanagel, which is uh, read in, uh, basically here in the neighborhood. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. We don't have a lot of time, so let's move on. Um, how do we build a web application if you don't know? Basically, it's mostly two main components. We have the client side. One example is using React. And then we have the server side where we do all the magic. We connect to database and we have the web server. We can use Kotlin. We can also use Python with Django and some other options. And the point is that I, I don't speak front end. So if I have to build something about front end, 
um, it gets very complicated for me, not just because of the language, but mostly because of um, the way you have to build the front end. So I don't know where to put the components. I don't know which components to use exactly. Uh, it takes a lot of time. And uh, I think that that was probably the most uh, um, interesting learning for me that whenever, whenever I have to deal with the front end side, I don't know exactly what to do apart from learning the language. And then I only know Python and I'm just like a data scientist who plays with Python every day. So this uh, also brings me to another point, which is sometimes you need more than a dashboard. You need more than Tableau because Tableau has some limitations. With Tableau, for instance, you can't play with Python as, as you want to. And another point is that if you want to do some magic behind Tableau, you cannot really do it. On the other way around, if you want to work with Jupyter Python, you can play with these widgets. I don't know if you heard about them. And you have some interactive elements in the, in the Python, uh, in the Jupyter notebook. But the point is that these elements are not great and you still have to deal with the Jupyter notebook. And if you want to present something to stakeholders, to some stakeholders, for instance, uh, it's not great because you, you, you cannot hide a lot of details. So this brought me to Streamlit. What is Streamlit? So Streamlit is an open source soft, uh, library. Um, now is part of Snowflake, as I said. Uh, it has a very nice user-friendly interface. So you can just use these uh, really nice methods and functions out of the box. You don't have to think too much about that. You just need to call the component, and then you will see the component rendered in the page. You can use Python, so you can do all the magic that, that you want behind this, this uh, uh, web application. and uh, Pretty much we can say that you don't need any front-end experience because Streamlit is taking care of everything. The layout, it has this cascade uh, approach where you create the elements and then Streamlit decides where to put these elements in the page. Basically, um, what you get from Streamlit is something like this. So this is done with Streamlit and uh, you won't believe, but this, this is probably a few lines of code apart from the Python magic happening under the hood, but the rest, the components, all these uh, uh, HTML components you see here are all managed by Streamlit, and you just have to call a few Python um, functions. You can play with plots, you can have sidebar, as, you, as we can see on the left, uh, you can add a logo, tables, buttons, slides, sliders, and so far, so on. So, of course, we start with pip install, but we don't have to talk about that. We all know what is it. And um, this is an example. So what does it take to have something like what I have on the right? Just a few lines of code. And if you, if you, if you look closely, you, if you look close, you will see that I'm actually um, creating these few components. And apart from the way, the part where I create the data in this case, the rest is just like, a couple of Streamlit functions. And the result is pretty amazing because I have an input text field, I have a button, I have a plot, and also some, some, some links and text in the page. So now let's have a look into a small use case. Here I'm trying to create um, this web application where I have some elements, I can interact with it, and then I can showcase whatever I'm doing with this, with this data. And this will be full interactive. So whenever I change something, we will see the results into the page. First, this is the code that I need to render and create the elements that I'm highlighting on the right. As you can see, apart from the beginning and the creation of the data set, the rest is basically three streamlit functions. I'm creating the header, the sidebar with the title, and that's it. Now we move to the rest. This is the code you need to create these two elements. So now we want to add some elements to the sidebar. We want to control the flow and then see the data uh, changing in the, in the page dynamically. And if you pay attention, you will see that basically I'm using the same function over and over. So I'm using this slider and I'm putting four sliders into the sidebar and then giving some, some information to the slider, like the, the, the title and, and the data um, and the range. And that's pretty much it. 
The second component is just a table. The nice thing about tables and data frames with Streamlit is that you just have to call the function uh, Streamlit write. You throw the data frame in it or the series, and that's it. You will see this really nice result. If you think about that, this is very expensive if you work with React. You, you need to know React. You need to decide where to place the table, how to place the table, and some other some, some other things that uh, need, needs to be uh, implemented some, some, in some way. Then we train and visualize. We're not really interested in the training part. It's just like four, four, four lines of code. Uh, what's interesting here is that the rest is the result of these um, six lines of code. As we can see, we have uh, the class labels, the prediction, the prediction probability. And uh, we're just throwing, once again, some um, NumPy series into, into Streamlit. And then Streamlit takes care of the rest. And, and that's it. We basically have our first web app application. And the code that you need is just the code we were checking out until now. If you want to check the full article, because I wrote the Medium article about this, you can, you can look into this. this uh, you can scan the QR code. Uh, I'm also adding more details about uh, some, some pitfalls and some things that I didn't like and some other like uh, interesting um, uh, pieces of code. And then I hate Streamlit, <laughs> this to, just to get your attention before the last two slides. I don't really hate Streamlit, but there are many things that I don't like. First, what I really like is that it's user-friendly. I really love Streamlit for, for prototyping. If you use it for prototyping, you don't, have, you don't need the front-end developer, but you can already have a glimpse of what the web application will look like. This is really interesting because it's so expensive to have a prototype like this. With Streamlit, you just need Python and the Streamlit library. It's also very cool whenever you want to show something, showcase something, instead of showing the Jupyter notebook and then your stakeholders will be super overwhelmed. You show something like this, you play with the sliders, you, you put some data in, and you can actually showcase uh, whatever you're working on. Um, you don't need front-end skills, and you have these very nice interactive widgets. But of course, there are some cons. Um, First of all, uh, hosting challenges. If you're working in Snowflake, maybe you don't have these challenges. Otherwise, you need to deploy this application somewhere. Um, you have some customization constraints. You will see a lot of workarounds, especially if you look into the Streamlit community. There are many things that people had to uh, create on top of Streamlit to have some, some um, components that are not available in Streamlit by default. And the most importantly, the performance limitations. If you have big data frames, a lot of data, a lot of Python code, you will see the Streamlit um, yeah, will not work as expected. And that's probably the biggest issue for me. So that's pretty much it. I'll be around for questions. And thank you. Yeah, I had the chance to maybe repeat the question for the people online. Yeah, if I had to look basically into some other competitors. Yeah. Um yeah, the, I, I did. Um honestly, um my my preference is still Streamlit, uh, because it's easy to use, but I, I wish that we have a library that puts together all the things that Streamlit provides and also the competitors are providing. Because I see that there are some things that are missing Streamlit that maybe are available in some other libraries. So yes, I did try them, but honestly, um, also because I was actually working on Streamlit, but while looking into some competitors, I decided to stick to Streamlit. But it's, it's really, it really depends on the use case. Yeah. Short question here because we already run out of only for me. I said it. I said it. I said it. The only one asking, the only one answering questions. I'm sorry for the <laughs>
maybe she told you about the background of this little boy and everything. So at what point of the story are we? Can you someone tell me? At what time of the story we are? What is the last thing that happened? Four hours ago, the mountain. Four that? Oh, and that mountain was filled with lots of things. And it was a little boy after all. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> it was just with the tricycle thingy, trying to go up in the mountain. Really irresponsible parents, if you ask me. I mean, going to a mountain for four hours, like, but also oh, okay. We're okay. ready. Okay, good. You have That's children, good. right? Yeah. No. No. Sorry. <laughs> cool. So let's welcome our next speaker, Ellen. I have to talk fast because I want to see the continuation of the story. So I hope I don't delay you from the continuation of this exciting story too long. But I'm also going to tell the story. And it's the story of actually a story that Tamara, who's sitting here, asked me about is like, how did I survive as a in tech for such a long time, belonging to an underrepresented gender? To me, I was a bit, honestly a bit confused by the question because I didn't die, so obviously it wasn't that hard. But <laughs> then I thought about maybe there's something that I can share about what helped me, and this is what I wanted to share today. So maybe who am I, and how did I how did I actually get into tech, and what what have I done there? So it started when I was 12 years old. My mom was at the time it was in the in the mid 90s, and she did some umschulung, some kind of career changer program from being a graphic or an art teacher into graphic design. And for some reason, they taught her programming in the process. And she was so excited about it, she decided, hey, my 12-year-old daughter needs to know this. And so she, she told me about how to code Hello World and make, in Trump Pascal, make things shine. Little, little shine, shiny stars appear on the, on the screen. I was very excited and I really loved it. And so it started. Later on, my mom got a job and she didn't have so much time anymore. But then I found that in the library they have coding books. And so I taught myself quick basic to coding books when I was around 15. And I, I took my computer apart all the time and all these kind of things that you do when you're really nerdy as a kid. And because I liked it so much, I decided, hey, why don't I study computer science? And I went to the University of Potsdam, which is close to Berlin, which is where I come from. And that was the first time I was, I was a bit confused about the whole experience because why were there only 10 women in a program out of 100 students? And that was weird. And it had some odd, it led to some odd moments, but overall I really enjoyed the experience actually. And I graduated and I did a bunch of internships in very cool places like India and the Netherlands and in Poland. Yep. And then I eventually, even though I liked my university experience a lot, I decided, hey, maybe it's time to graduate and get a job, a proper job. And so I went, I first worked in a in a bunch of Java Java shops in in a web agency. The actually my first consulting job at Copgeni actually sent me back to Hamburg here, and I worked here for about a year commuting every time. And then I yeah, but I got tired of commuting. Then I went to this this Java place, and then I worked in a whole bunch of other places. I I originally worked as a backend engineer. Then I decided I want to try my hands on data. So I worked as a data scientist and a data engineer. And I really enjoyed it. I also got a lot into the different communities like the Pi Ladies, who, who many of you are familiar with, Red Girls Berlin, which Paola briefly mentioned, but who also run the Summer of Code, and a whole bunch of other things. So I must say, I really enjoyed my career in tech. And now I'm working as a manager since a couple of years. Right now at Alzheimer, which is a climate tech company. And I still really enjoy it. And I'm sad to hear that this is not always the case for some of the underrepresented people in tech. And so that's why I, I want to share a bit what helped me and maybe it helps some other people. I, obviously, I don't have the solution to for everybody because everybody is very distinct. But I want to talk about two things. One is su surviving, so staying in the field and f finding your place. And the other thing is about thriving, experiencing joy and success in the field. And for a shortness of time, I'll mostly focus on the first section and I give a few outlooks on what the rest might look like. So for me, surviving really and staying in the field really comes down to two things. One is the identity and belonging. And the other thing I talk later is believing that you actually can contribute in this field. But the, really the basic is just, do I fit in here and do I identify as somebody? And for me, that was a big challenge. Originally, I'm already hinted at it when I when I joined my computer science studies, and I felt very 
not isolated, but very standing out. And I was always the odd one out with my, with my gender. And that was irritating. And to me, the real insight came not when I watched the Matrix movie, but it, it echoes something that is, that is a scene in this movie where Trinity tells Neo, there's a scene where, where they are driving down the street in the Matrix and Neo tells me, oh, I used to eat noodles here. And then Trinity says, but none of this is real. And Trinity says, yeah, that's because the Matrix cannot tell you who you are. And for me, that was the insight that really changed things. For me, that the patriarchy might tell me, yeah, you don't belong here because of your gender, because of whatever, you, whatever because your career change or whatever else might be the case. But that's just not a story I have to buy in. It's just something that that comes at me, but it's not something that I sh get to shape my own identity. And how that helped me belong is up here. So what I realized over the time is my our identities are really multifaceted. So I have an entity, an identity as a nerd, as a friend, as a computer science graduate, as a tech manager, as a dancer, as a traveler, as a non-binary person, and a whole bunch of other things that I didn't fit on the screen. And I, some of them connect me with this community and some of them don't. And I choose to, because for instance, now the identity is so strong for me, that always helped me really connect with people. And so for me, it was really a choose about which part of my identity do I focus on and how, do, how does that connect me with people? And I'm not talking about hiding parts of your identity necessarily because it gets really uncomfortable. It's more about looking at the things that, that really connect me. So that's why the flashlight there, there are some parts of my identity that I chose to highlight in some aspects and others that I don't like. And that made a huge difference. Yeah. And then the other part is uh, self-efficiency, which I already mentioned is an individual's belief in their capacity to act in ways necessary to reach specific goals, which just means if you want to be successful in tech, you need to believe that you actually can be successful in tech and that you can actually achieve something in this field. Otherwise, even if you feel you belong, it's going to be a very frustrating experience. And this is this quote is from an academic article on or academic research on self-efficiency. And it turns out there are three factors that really influence self-efficiency and they are, they are ordered by how important they are. So they're really the first important thing. And that's why programs like the one Paloma talked about earlier in our team that are so important is past performance. So if you have a history of having some kind of success in this field and being recognized for that, that has a huge impact. So the first thing I would really recommend anybody who wants to establish in their field is figure out where they can be successful. And even if it's in a small way, still building on successes, it's much easier than having initial failure because that will almost guarantee you to, that you hate your experience ongoing because it builds up. The next thing is vicarious experiences, which is role model, really a long, long and academic expression for a role model. So that's why communities like the Pi Ladies and other communities are really so important. And finally, the last one is verbal persuasion, which means pretty much just saying, yeah, you can do this. And here's how they play that for me. So you already saw in my story and I highlighted a few aspects of this. I'm pretty happy with my career, no matter what anybody might think about it. I'm very happy with how I learned and taught myself from books in, when I was younger and how I studied, got a master in computer science and the places I've worked. And I also had a lot of role models, starting with my mom who taught me programming in the beginning, but also I was always very inspired by a lot of the really cool tech friends, Teresa is one of them. And there's a lot of, lot of other cool women that I could have put there. And also the first people that actually did programming, including other Lovelace and also the first pro programmers that worked in the 50s, 40s and 50s and 30s, they were all actually women and only then did their career turn into a male dominated field for various reasons. And so that is something that always really inspired me to, and told me, hey, I can do this. And it's maybe just a historic accident that they are, I know that my, my gender is so underrepresented. And finally, verbal persuasion. I really love this talk, which I saw several years ago at Code Motion by Brigitte Böckler, who later became a colleague at ThoughtWorks. And she really talks about how the, I can highly recommend this talk, by the way, if anybody's interested in how the, 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 the image of the software programmer has developed actually from it being a very women, women dominated field into a very nerdy male dominated field. 
and that was really eye-opening. And there's a lot of similar talks. But this one I particularly recommend. Yeah, and then I really don't, I wish I had more time to go into what, what goes once, once you feel comfortable in the field and you feel you can achieve something. And there's a few things that I would love to highlight. And I've written about some of them on my LinkedIn profile and I want to write about a bunch of them more. And maybe one day I turn this into a longer talk, then there's more time to talk about this. One is like not so the microaggression, so these little itty bitty things that tell you apps, do, do I really fit in here and how to not deal with them. Really important to me is negotiating the work reality so that it's actually welcoming and comfortable because as software engineers or managers or other tech people, we have a lot of leverage and we sometimes underestimate how much we can shape our reality. Guarding our sense of agency, which is kind of related to that. So having this feeling that we can actually change our environment and make it comfortable to us. And last but not least, turning men into allies. Yep, and that is my talk. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the story now. Yes, Mutani. Thank you very much, Eden. And now we will <laughs> now we will have a, a break. But if you are here earlier, maybe we can continue the story. Uh, the next talk will start at eleven thirty-six. Not 35, not 38, 36. So you have some break now to, maybe now is a good time to ask the questions that you wanted to ask for the previous speakers yeah. with a coffee outside. And also think about how exact we are about numbers here. So with the deciding on how high the, the mountain is, you will have to really be super accurate. This is how we roll here, yeah? Good. So then no pressure. enjoy the break and see you in some minutes.
continue. Okay, so so the kid got up the mountain and he found the monastery and then um, he knocks and says, excuse me, Mr. Monk, hello, how do you do? I am a kid who lives downstairs in this very windy city and I heard this very strange noise. Yeah, it was like, I really, 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 you know, I'm so curious about what this noise is. Guess what the monk says? Well, actually, the kid asked, can you tell me what the noise is? Of course, you should always ask a question. I'll just expect an answer. But who here, what do you think could have been that noise? Hmm? Nobody? Just any guess? The noise of the washing machine. The monastery in the top of the mountain, you think? Could... <laughs> it was like a very strange noise. That's not very, very strange. Very strange. Also, noise. Because here that it was a little kid, so you cannot describe noises in a good way. But yeah, it was a strange noise coming. From exactly, a strange the noise. So yeah. Well, the monk says, "I'm really sorry. I can't tell you now. You're not a monk." <laughs> but that does not mean we cannot go on with our conference. The story's and not over, uh, right? yeah, it's not over. So we'll see what happens because the kid will live with this. So. Here we have Lorenzo. Okay. I really hope there's more. Well, thank you for that. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Lorenzo. I have been for the last 14 years uh, very passionate and actively working in Python and more specifically in, in Django. I had also the privilege of being an organizer of the first Python pizza, I think we did in the other side of the world, in Holguin, Cuba, in 2020. Yeah, that, Yeah, it happened in 2020, 2021, last year, and this year we're still deciding what's going to happen, but it was a privilege. That's me, actually, in, in Holguin, eating one of the Cuban pizzas, which we fall and eat like that. Very strange. And I also happen to be back-end engineer at Alaska in, in Munich. If you follow the QR code, you may find something interesting about. Now, an exercise for you. I want you to take a very close look at this URL. And I'd like you to search your feelings and see how do you feel about it. <laughs> and I'm going to help you. You have to pick between these emotions. <laughs> And anyone has other emotion other than that? Maybe joy, <laughs> pleasure? All right. Yeah, I thought the same. But I thought it was a problem that I only had, so I had to take it online. Because every, every time we think we have something and it's only ours, we have to take it online to see how other people react. So I actually made a poll about whether people actually care about your else when they visit a web application. And this might not be uh, st statistically relevant because I unfortunately have not a large uh, follower base, but let's try a, a, a real life version here. Raise your hand if when you use a web application, you do care about how the URLs look, okay? Uh, you don't care now? Raise your hand if you don't care. And raise your hand if you only want to see the results. <laughs> yeah, that, that only works online, okay. But apparently, the trend is similar. So people tend to care about URLs. And then this is the title of the talk, uh, Who Cares About URLs? I made a mistake of showing the title to a colleague. He thought it was a question. And he said, yeah, man, who cares about URLs? <laughs> but actually, actually, it's not a question. It's more of, an, uh, of a statement that doesn't have an ending yet. Who cares about URLs and then ellipses? And that's what I'm going to be talking about. And this gentleman on the left, he really cares about URLs. You know him? Tim Berners-Lee, of course, he's a little biased because he invented them in 1994. And then, of course, he's entitled to have opinions and have preferences and have uh, write blog posts about how your else can be. And this happened in 1998. And he said, listen, you're not supposed to change your else. Uh, when you change your URL on your server, you really n never know who you're going to break. Like, we have all these QR codes everywhere. Uh, if you change the URL, you never know what's going to happen, who you are going to break. This means 
that the moment you put a URL out there, you have to be very careful, very sure, very happy about what you're putting out there because if you want to be a good web citizen, you are supposed to not break it, not change it. And yeah, it is our job then, he thinks, and I also think, to not just create web applications, but, but also think a little bit about how these web applications are gonna be routed using URLs. So it's our job also to design URLs. He, uh, Tim, also goes the length of saying, we have to be capable of designing URLs that are capable of enduring two years, 20 years, 200 years of time. And well, maybe after 20 years, his, his opinions have changed a little bit. But in general, the idea is we have to be very conscious about our decisions. Of course, everyone who has ever tried to design URLs that last for 20 years have most likely uh, encountered in a melting situation because reality is different. Sometimes you need to change them. Sometimes you thought you had an idea of what your product was, but then the product changes and then you need to revamp the whole thing. And something, something uh, must, must be changed. You have to change and react with life to change. So yeah, we have friends, we have some allies in the web world whenever we have to change URLs. And I want to remind you about five of those friends we have, and it's of course redirects. Ideally, we shouldn't have to change them, but uh, whenever we have to, uh, we have the possibility to keep them uh, alive, keep them online, keep them accessible, and then just redirect to the new version of it. And we have resources to do so. You're probably familiar with these two. Have you ever seen them? Yeah. 302 is the one we use uh, a lot because every time uh, we submit a post uh, and we have a successful a result out of that uh, operation, we typically redirect to somewhere else. And this is just a temporary redirect. And then we also have the permanent redirect trio one, which signals that that URL is meant to never be accessed anymore. And tells the people that, yeah, you, you have to use the new one, not the old one, because the old one we're just keeping because we want to be good web citizens, but not because they are being used anymore. But I don't know if you knew also of this, these other two. Did you know about them, 307 and 308? Raise your hand if you knew about them. All right, good for you, I didn't know about them. And technically, what's, what's the situation here? Uh, the, the first two were supposed to respect the HTTP verb. If I made a post and then I get a redirection, I was supposed to get the redirection using the same HTTP verb that I initially used. But that was almost never respected. And therefore, these two were also created or designed, so to say, so that the verb could be respected. And then if you do a put to some place and that place has moved to a different location, that redirection should be also uh, with a put. And then the HTTP verb shouldn't change. And the same for 308, which is meant to be a permanent redirect. But I am 100% sure that you, you've never, ever, ever heard of this one. 309, replace user bookmarks. <laughs> And the reason why you never heard of this one is because it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, whenever somebody bookmarks a URL, you don't have control anymore of, uh, over that. Because it would be a security problem if you were capable of actually replacing the bookmarks of the user. So if somebody ever took this URL and bookmarked it, you have two choices. You either break them or keep this thing forever. And that's why it's also quite important that we learn and embrace and enjoy also designing URLs. So a few tips, if you want to actually become one of those who care about URLs, a few tips that could be a little opinionated on how to design better URLs. Number one, make them readable. Why? Because people will read them and some people will even search them. Some people will even remember what the URL was and will try to type what they remember from the URL in the search bar. And take one of these examples of a not so readable URL and then a, a one that is supposed to be better. There are of course use cases where obfuscation is a necessity and that's okay, but for the vast majority of the cases, make them readable. Also make them predictable. If I am taking a look at the page and I see the structure of your menu, 
and I see the URL, I should be able to guess navigate the site just by replacing parts of the URL from what I see in the site. It's also really nice to make them predictable. Also, it's good to make them concise, like, yeah, user, user settings, security settings, that's nice, but if we can go straight to the point without removing too much information, information and having no redundancy, that would be even better. Also, it's good to make them complete. For instance, what if your website has, a, has something on user setting security, has something on user, but has nothing on user settings? Somebody will probably try to go there and see there is nothing. At least we should make a redirect in this situation. Also, we should make them consistent. Single language, single style. Uh, sometimes we try to make them in the language, the, the, the main language of the page, but that doesn't contribute when you are actually looking at them because it's a combination of styles and languages and that is not so nice. And finally, if possible, make them also beautiful. This is a hot topic because what is a beautiful URL? What is a beautiful URL? Well, uh, snake case is beautiful. Kebab is also beautiful. Camel, uh, trialing slashes or not, uh, .html, .php, .aspx. My concept of beauty that I want to leave you with is if it's well designed, it's going to be beautiful. So if you care about your L's, please design them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Here are some. QR codes for links that hopefully won't break. <laughs> Are the URLs of the QR codes nice? Or... <laughs> hopefully, yes. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you very much. So in the meantime, I can continue the story where there is a setting up everything. How does the boy feel? Of course you feel bad. Imagine going to a high mountain in your tricycle, then knocking on this wheel. After four hours, then of course, then you want some results, and the, then you need to go back, and then it's like, Okay, well, what is it now? So I need to do something else different with my life. So the boy, after this huge deception, decided, okay, I will just go back and start again the four hours trip back to their Well, home. might be shorter. All right, because if you, <laughs> if you throw yourself into the mountain, then maybe you will start you know, even faster. <sighs> but this is not over. Kids. No, but we need still well we need still to do the resharing. So kid goes down and down and try to say thinking about what is something that I need to achieve in my life or what do I need to do to somehow discover this mystery, right? He has to listen to Serena's talk, right? Right. Yeah. Listening to Serena's talk is one of the requirements. So let's give a warm welcome to Serena. Wait. Try now. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. You will not look at the screen. All right. <laughs> I just. Okay. So thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me over, and thank you for being here right. today. Um, I want to talk to you about a couple of things. Let's see how. You're going to like them. Um, my name is um, uh, Serena Bonaretti. Um, I am a senior researcher, a researcher at the Balgris campus in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, it's a, a research institute. And uh, my job is to create tools for open and reproducible musculoskeletal imaging research. And I focus mainly on making computational workflows open and reproducible and uh, uh, making data as open as possible. Uh, my background is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my background is uh, uh, biomedical engineering. I worked uh, and uh, studied internationally, as you can see here. And uh, today I would like to tell you about the two projects that I am involved in. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, uh, the Ormir community. Uh, that is the open and reproducible musculoskeletal imaging research community. So um, as a researcher in MSK, musculoskeletal, we say MSK, uh, we, our job is to extract the quantifications 
from medical images of uh, the musculoskeletal system. Um, and the final goal is uh, to investigate chronic and debilitating diseases such as osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, muscular dystrophies, and so on. And as you can see here from the scanners of uh, MR and CT, I think all of us know what uh, they are, we um, acquire images. We tend mainly to segment uh, organs, different structures, and then we quantify. For example, there you see a map of cartilage thickness, or you see 3D reconstructions of bones. Um, the motivation of uh, creating a community uh, started from a practical problem. And the practical problem is that the code that we deal uh, across the different laboratories worldwide is that our code is very fragmented. And what it means, it is that it is made partially from proprietary software uh, where um, that comes mainly from uh, uh, scanner providers. And so there we cannot verify parameters, implementations, and we're researchers, right? We want to look inside the black box. Um, and uh, um, it's very hard to adapt uh, the code to other images or anatomies if we need to. On the other side, we have in-house software and consider that for the majority, we are not trained as computer scientists. So beyond the fact that our code maybe is not the robust, uh, the most robust one around, um, the, the life of the code is very often linked to the employment of the creator, which means a PhD student. And this means that when the PhD student leaves, very often that code dies. Um, and this goes together, we tend to have a lack of documentation. So it's really hard to use uh, existing code. So our solution to this uh, is called the open science, which is a relatively recent movement, at least uh, in, uh, in biomedical engineering, um, where our aim is uh, to put together code and data that we have from different laboratories worldwide and trying to build something uh, homogeneous uh, that we can use uh, across laboratories. So our aim, as I uh, mentioned uh, before, the first one is uh, to create uh, open, reproducible, well-tested and well-documented <laughs> software to analyze musculoskeletal images. The second one is uh, more related to data, and it is to standardize the data acquisition and storage, both uh, to favor data sharing and also algorithm comparison. Consider that in medical imaging, doing deep learning or machine learning, for example, it's kind of hard because we don't have enough data. Uh, we should combine it together, and to combine it together, we need to standardize it. Um, and then to promote, of course, a culture of openness and reproducibility for a faster advancement in the field. We want to, to work together so that we get faster in providing and in, in, in hopefully understanding something more about diseases. Uh, how we started? We started in 2019 thanks uh, to uh, a Jupiter Community Workshop. Um, Jupiter Community, uh, every year, um, I think they are going to restart now, provide some grants to start. And here you see we were in Maastricht um, in the Netherlands. Um, and from there, we started our community. And uh, nowadays, uh, four years later, we are more than 40 international researchers. There are people from uh, Canada, um, actually from all the Americas, uh, Europe, uh, Middle East, uh, and Australia. And uh, uh, we hope that we will extend to Asia and uh, Africa as well, of course. Uh, the achievements so far, uh, we have created and we are working on some Python packages. Um, you can see here the Python packages. Um, uh, yeah, uh, anyway, so the Python packages like Chiclopi and Ormir SCT, XCT are for high resolution um, CT images of bone and uh, both for um, um, uh, analysis and for uh, mechanical uh, simulations. Pioneer is uh, for uh, uh, cartilage segmentation, and Daphne and uh, muscle beads uh, are for muscle images. And you see here the, their GitHub repositories. Other achievements uh, that we have, that we are building on, is the templates. And uh, for example, we have created templates for uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, or for uh, GitHub readme files. So uh, the idea is that in our community and hopefully beyond, people just download the template of a Jupyter notebook and they structure all the notebooks in the same way, at least when these notebooks become reports or become uh, use cases. 
we have some guidelines um, and then some learning materials that either we created ourselves or we link it to from other conferences. The other project that we wanted to, uh, that I would like to share with you is a book that I'm writing. And the story behind this book is the following. So uh, I had to teach uh, Python at a certain point and I was looking for material. And the one of the um, blogs that I found was uh, were, were stressing the fact that Python is a programming language and it's a language. So I looked into how to learn uh, foreign languages. And when we learn a foreign language, we usually have two kind of, kinds of books course books that are the ones where we learn uh, greetings and uh, how to uh, buy apples at the market and whatever. And instead, grammar books uh, are the books uh, where we um, learn first all the verbs and all the nouns and so on. And we do all the exercises and we have all the rules and so on. And uh, when I looked into books uh, to learn uh, Python, what I found were for me what I would say grammar books. So in these books, at first, all the chapters are about data types, so lists and strings and so on, and then uh, for loops or whatever. And it is very hard for new beginners to actually put the different pieces of the puzzle together, the different pieces of the language. And so what I'm trying to do with this book is actually to create a course book that uh, teaches people or uh, teaches beginners how to think in coding. Um, so here we are, uh, Py uh, Learn Python with uh, Jupyter is a free course book. Anybody can download it for free at uh, learnpythonwithjupyter.com um, that aims at teaching Python using Jupyter Notebook while developing what it is uh, called, academically speaking, computational thinking. And uh, it's work in progress. I've published the 22 chapters out of 38, although all the material is, uh, is um, uh, I have the material, um, but it takes a little bit of time for me to publish it because I can publish a new chapter only every four to six, to six weeks because I write it around uh, working hours. Um, and again, it's a course material that I created for students of different background and age. And uh, uh, if you teach Python, I would recommend this method for students that are at least 14 or 16 years old and uh, above. I would say 14 is the minimum. Mm. So there is a focus on computational thinking. With computational thinking, I mean, again, the way we think when we code. And uh, the method that I created uh, is a sort of linguistic approach. So the book is structured like a... Um, course book. So there is first a narrative, a little story where the code is embedded into, for example, you are in a bookstore and uh, like a new customer wants a book, what do you do, blah, blah. Then there is uh, some explanation, computational thinking with the details on the syntax, the definitions, theoretical encoding exercises, a recap in bullet point and any more in-depth session. Um, the progression of topics across the chapters goes uh, from more concrete to abstract thinking. So we move, uh, for example, to manipulating lists uh, using methods that are words into manipulating lists uh, using uh, symbols like slicing. And then, okay, there are also, of course, some parts about to divide and conquer, best practices, algorithms, and so on. Why Jupyter Notebook? Because it allows us to embed code into narrative. So nar having a narrative around code, exactly like when in textbooks we uh, learn the little story of the guy who goes to the market or to the mountain and blah, blah. Um, here we can uh, learn the little story about the grocery shopping and memorize it together with the um, um, if-els and the some methods and so on and it helps the structure in the code and then i know that i'm talking to a lot of programmers but for uh, completely new beginners the terminal is scary and uh, and the jupyter notebook instead it's friendly it's in the browser they know how to use it um so if you uh, are interested in two i know you know how to code maybe even better than me but please have a look at the Jupyter, uh, learn Python with Jupyter.com and refer it to your friend or start it yourself. And of course, uh, get in touch uh, if you want to join the Ormir community, if you want to share experiences about community building or want to know more about the book, uh, either during 
uh, our coffee breaks, uh, or these are my references. Uh, thank you very much. So first, a little announcement. We got more stickers <laughs> with two different colors. <laughs> Please approach that fancy table there so you can get more things. But the, back to our business. So one of the most important things that I was talking before is the frustration that you get after such failure and a long trip, being a short age. You can understand that how that can shape your life. So he came back, started to, you know, has his life back, helping the family around. You need to know it's just in the middle of nowhere. And the year, the time was passing things was changing and um, at some point he you know got a fancy bike because why not going around mounting and he remembers but wait, wait. is this bike in HTMX or is that it might be you might. never know with it yeah. is it the... we're almost ready yeah he got a, a bike okay time. wait Seems but to work. Mark is going to tell us about the bike and yeah, Martin, you're, you're going to talk about bike? bike references? Uh, actually, I, I do like, I don't have bike references yet, but maybe we'll find them afterwards. <laughs> but I do like bicycles. But you have a bike, right? I do have a bike and Only I... One? No? How many bikes do you have? Two? <laughs> let's, have it. let's... Okay, anyway, let's... Oh, I, no, we so, forgot to share the screen. So I can tell you more about the bike. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you need to understand that living in the middle of nowhere, getting a fancy bike, it's, it's a big deal. I mean, imagine Do you yourself. call him? He doesn't. Do you live in the middle of nowhere? Okay. Oh, you're talking about the boy? Yes. Oh, yes. But, <laughs> maybe, but, that is, but maybe the idea of the boy, it's in... Sorry. But that's I, you are very amb amb ambiguous. Okay. I, I have to explain to you the difference between tricycle, bicycle. No, he I, grew up. I can grew up. infer it from the, from the name. Is it working now? Okay, so we can Is see. it working now? Okay, let's, let's we welcome will find Martin out. then. Okay, thanks very much. So, um, we have a lot of talks about links already and about web developing, and here's another one of those, because as a Python developer, you might uh, need to uh, provide something on a website. So uh, for that, I have choose HTMX and avoid learning too much JavaScript. A little bit about me. I'm old enough to uh, be with HTML uh, at the, from the beginning. But hey, I write software for very companies. Uh, I support it too. It's mainly booking systems. Uh, Navision is the main tool in which the software is written. But I use Python for everything else and provide connectors to these. And as I said, I'm. Um, uh, I've been there from the beginning, so uh, I know how uh, the web looked when it was new. And we used to have classic HTML with uh, not much, I have to make sure that this works, sorry about that, uh, with not much interaction. Uh, and uh, classic HTML looks like this. It's a web page. It has a header, it has a body. The body is the thing you're going to see in your web browser. And that's about it. But if you want to have interactive elements with your web page, then there isn't much because there's the links. Hey, you can click these. There's a form where you can type in things. And let's see who remembers the next one. There's the meta refresh command. Uh, I actually verified that it still works, uh, which uh, refreshes your page after a couple of seconds and brings you to the next one. All of these uh, are server controlled experiences. Basically, if you uh, trigger any of these, the server will send you back a full HTMX page, uh, HTML page. And if you click on view source in your browser, you will get something that you can understand. Now, currently, the situation is like this. Uh, commonly, uh, are the web pages driven by JavaScript. They require understanding of the JavaScript requirement and the tools. They use frameworks like React, Vue.js, and more. Uh, they often communicate with the back end by uh, JSON, not HTML. And the browser modifies the DOM for you uh, on the client, so you don't really have control about this. Now, if you do view source on this, it's pointless, because you're not going to learn anything from this. You're not going to understand this and just be confused. So uh, there's HTMX. So how can HTMX end that confusion? In a nutshell, it's a JavaScript library which helps you avoid writing JavaScript. It removes the constraints of classic HTML 
every element can now be interactive. The server responses can be fragments of pages. Uh, it's created by Carson Gross from Big Sky Software with a business-friendly BSD2 license, so you can use it. It's available at htmx.org with good documentation. And how do you install this? Well, you open your HTML page and put this line in. And then you have it. You can also save it in your project and serve it locally. It's less than 50K, so that is not so hard. And if you do that, this is what you get. You get uh, uh, an attribute that defines which events trigger an action to trigger, like click, load, but there's also mouse over and many more. Uh, you can define what kind of agent requests you want to trigger, like get, post, but now new, put and delete. Uh, you can define where the response from the server is going to go. That's the target. And there is a boost thing that will allow you to turn normal links into HTMX links, which means only the body of the result will be looked at. So let's see three examples uh, with a fast API backend, because I think that's something that some Python developers here who don't know how to develop for the web will be using. Uh, the first one is a login example. So uh, when I have HTMX, the idea is I can serve fragments of a page, not always a full page. So when my backend needs to know if it's supposed to send a full page or not, and, and it can see this by looking at the request headers, because if the header is uh, HTMX uh, request is set to true, then this is an HTMX request. And uh, so I can send a partial request. Otherwise, it's a normal request, and I'll just send the stuff I would always send. And this is like a, a short example code that you, by the way, can see the link to at the last slide, so you can try it at home. Um, uh, this is how it looks in the source code. The red area is a diff element that is called login area. The green is the form which posts to a login endpoint at FastAPI. It has the target login area, which is the red thing, and it swaps the entire outer HTML. So basically, if the form is sent, the server answer will be put in the red box and replace everything that's in it. But if your login is wrong, there is a little blue box, login fail. We don't want the form to go away. We want you to have a little message that the login has failed. So how's the backend for this? Now, if the login works, I'm just going to get a session ID. I'm going to store the session ID in my globals. I'm going to render this as a template so that I can serve you that session ID as a cookie later. And uh, this is what I could, would send back to the uh, web browser as a successful answer. You can see the div ID login area again. I'm replacing this with just a text, login successful, and put in an invisible object, which has a trigger of after this page is loaded, one second later, just access this little bit of JavaScript code and put the session in the cookie. And then uh, I'll send you off to the main page, but I'm going to replace the login area with this. And with this little bit of code, now suddenly your login page is replaced with a new page where you can do stuff. But if your login is failed, then I just send this answer. Login unsuccessful, please try again. And now I don't want to replace the whole box. So what I'm doing here is I prepare the response with a text, but then I change the header and say it's HX retarget, log and fail, send that. And that means that the text will now be put in the blue box. Example number two, let's have some more interactivity. Um, it's a live search. So on our pizza page, we have a little box where you can type in your favorite topics and it will automatically show you a pizza that you might want. So how do we auto update this box? So we have the input here, and we add an HX get um, to this called search pizza. We have a trigger. Whenever you type in this thing, every uh, twice every second, if it's changed, send this to the trigger. And the target is search result, which is the blue box. Uh, sorry, which is the green box here. And this is where your results will show up. And this is the Python code at the back end for this. It will just uh, prepare an HTML fragment <laughs> with the pizzas. OK, and another example is dashboards, because you often have uh, pages where you have to update many things and you want to show how the status changes. So how can you do that? Here's a little small example. There's our kitchen status. We have one pizza that's currently being made. You can see the order status of this. And uh, in the green box, there is a second element, which is now for the sake of the example, a time. So 
how do I get that into a dashboard? The first thing is I have to import another line of code because uh, the server side events are an extra script that not everybody uses. So if you want that, put that in your header. Then you need to use a backend that can do server side events. And we are in luck. Fast API has Starlet. Starlet can do this. And then you can put in an SSE element in your HTMX. And you call it diff h extension SSE, connect to this endpoint. And whenever you get a new message, swap it. <laughs> and this is the code for this. Um, there is a endless loop in here that will be left if your request is disconnected. And uh, now in the green box, I'm starting to prepare some information about the pizzas continued here. I'm joining that. Or if I have no pizzas in preparation, I'll just have a body that says, hey, no pizzas. Uh, and then I have an out of bound body, which is now here the green little clock that I want to show. And I'm telling this span that is an AX swap out of bound true. So this is something that is outside of the scope of my original target. And there's one rule I have to give out the out of bound elements first before I return the content. So I yield that and then I'll sleep for a second and I do it again until the client goes away. And this all is an event source response and you can see it on your dashboard. And if you look at this in your developer tools, you then can see that uh, the red box and the, the green box are flashing every second. So you can see the updates happening in that. And the real cool thing about this is even if your server breaks down and comes back later, this thing is going to reconnect and the dashboard is going to start working again. Okay, bonus content. We have time for that. This is on the internet. Final thoughts about this. <laughs> I love the concept because it's so easy to understand. And HTMX and vanilla JavaScript is all I need for my use, my use cases. Yours might be different. Uh, I'm using this in production already for a few months. I'm happy with the stability and with the performance. And uh, only time will tell if this was a good choice or not. So if you see me at one of the other Python conferences, come up and ask me if I still like it. <laughs> so thanks for your attention. At, <laughs> at this barcode, there is a link to my GitHub, which gives you the full example. You can download it and play with HTMX and uh, then have a, a look how all this stuff works. And if you have one of these social thingies like Mastodon or LinkedIn, you can find me on those. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it is just in time. Cool. So now where is, there you are. In the meantime, I can continue. So we were before at understanding the importance of having a bike in that such environment. And one day in the afternoon, he was just relaxing, just lying around the field. And he but he was also older, right? A little bit older. Let's How say old? a couple of years pass, three, what? four years. You're talking about here like a more slow life, so it's completely fine. It's like, is it the same kind of growing old like when you're waiting for pizza? Yeah, kind of. That feeling? <laughs> when you're hungry also. Yeah, so. I, he started to listen to the noise. Are you hungry? So she's hungry. So, OK. So the noise came back. And now we will discover that maybe Bilge will tell us in the talk. So let's give uh, Bilge a warm welcome. Hello, everyone. I know we are hungry, so I don't want to be the person who stands between you and the pizza. So we'll just directly start. First of all, I must say that because the pizza has not yet arrived. Oh, OK. <laughs> then I can go longer. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I need to say that I'm very happy that this animation works here because I was like very curious. Um, so today we are going to talk about building NLP apps with Python. And you will be able to understand some of the NLP terms, even if you're totally newbie, hopefully. So let's quickly jump. Uh, but first, uh, about me, I work as a developer. Oh, my name is Bilge. Uh, I work as a developer advocate at DeepSet, and DeepSet is the company behind the open source LLM framework Haystack. Uh, this is my first time at Hamburg Python Pizza. Actually, this is my first in person presentation, so I'm pretty Ooh. excited to be here. Yeah, thank you. Um, I am from, I am based in Istanbul, Turkey, so I do really come from really far, far away. 
Uh, I love Latin music, so if you're interested also in Latin music, let's have a chat right after the presentation. And I share some of my social media accounts here so you can contact me from these channels. All right, so today's agenda is we're going to talk about text embeddings, vector databases, retrieval, LLMs, and then we're going to build a generative question answering app together. Have you ever heard any of these terms before, although you don't know what they mean? Okay, that, that like quite some people, so that's nice. All right, let's start with embeddings. So for us, language is clear. There are letters, words, and sentences. So when I say to be or not to be, you know what I mean, right? But it's not the case for computers. So, I mean, they don't know what I mean when I say like to be or not to be because they're not speaking, they're not speaking the language that I'm speaking. So their language is numbers. So I need to find a way to convert this sentence to numbers. And this is what we actually call text embeddings. It's a array of numbers basically. Uh, so when I create these text embeddings, they, the sentence, so the, the meaning of a sentence, sentence become manageable by computers. And there are also different techniques for that. You can go with the sparse vectors, like uh, with approaches like TFIDF, VM25, or you can go with dense embeddings that you can generate by using some of the embedding models that can, they can be open source like sentence transformers, or they can be from model providers such as Cohere, OpenAI, or there are a lot of them out there. And the, as you can see, I mean, for demonstration purposes, this text embedding has eight dimensions, but usually the text embeddings has to, I mean, there are around 768 dimensions and they can even go like larger. Okay, now that we know what text embeddings and text vectors are, I think like vector databases makes more sense now because they are basically databases that are there to store the vectors that we are generating for our text. Um, traditionally, uh, databases contain um, strings, numbers, or any other scalar, scalar data in rows and columns. Uh, but vector databases, they store the 768 dimension vectors. That's why the operations, so they are optimized for vectors. So they are good at doing CRUD operations on these large vectors or some of other uh, 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 operations like metadata filtering. And another related term for text embeddings and vector databases is retrieval. So imagine you have all of your text and text embeddings in your vector database. And you have also a query and you also have the embedding for the query. And what do you do? So you want to get some relevant information from your database. And this action is actually called retrieval. It's basically getting the most relevant information to the query. And this step, this retrieval step is necessary for semantic search or question answering applications. Or if you have any other ideas, they're also useful. I mean, you will be hearing this term a lot. Another fancy term is LLMs. They stand for large language models, but I mean, as you can understand from the name, they are actually like big language models, nothing like way different than other uh, NLP models. But um, in practice though, this term LLM has taken on, on a more specific meaning. Like it's often used to refer to those language models that can generate coherent human-like outputs in response to instructions by a user that we call prompt. And uh, with these models, we can do a lot of things. We can do text generation, such as like summarization, generative QI, or writing code, chatting, or you can even ask these models to write a poem about autumn in Hamburg. So this, probably you are familiar with this UI, it's ChatGPT, and I just asked it to write a poem about autumn in Hamburg and like it generated the text. So 
uh, now that we are familiar with these terms, we can now talk about uh, how to build a generative question answering application together. I mean, it would have been way easier if we could just directly use an LLM uh, or, or ChatGPT, for example, for our quest generative question answering app, right? So, but I tried that. I asked ChatGPT, what is the story of Python Pizza Conference? But ChatGPT responded as, as of my last knowledge of date in January 2022, there isn't a specific and widely recognized event called the Python Pizza Conference. So, I mean, it doesn't know, or it just says like, I mean, this is a very specific question. I don't want to answer that because probably my knowledge is not up to date. I mean, it is the case. Usually their knowledge is updated till the certain point in time and they don't know about what happened later in the world after that time. But we can fix this. We can fix this by prompting. And this is the other prompt that I used for this. It's, I mean, as you can see, it's way longer the, than the previous prompt, but at least as a response, I could get a better answer. Now, this time it could say that the Python Pizza Conference originated with the Python Pizza Naples, and it's now organized by the Hamburg, Pizza, Ham, Hamburg Python Pizza community. I mean, if you can just use the same prompt with ChatGPT, you'll also get the similar answer. But let's see what we have changed in the prompt. So if you look at this here, I just put the context in the prompt. And this context I retrieved from the website of Hamburg Python Pizza. And then I asked the same question here. What is the story of Python Pizza Conference? And that's why I could get a better answer. So this approach is called retrieval augmented generation. Basically, augmenting my prompt, enriching my prompt, with more relevant data so that the ChatGPT or any other LLM has information about my question. But the thing is, for I mean, this time it was easy because I could just go and check the website and paste the content here, right? But if I want to build a real life question answering system, it's not very feasible. Like I cannot scale this. I cannot like go and check the website and copy paste the prompts there. So I need, I need something uh, better to, to automize this process. And this is where Haystack comes into play. Um, Haystack is a fully open source framework built in Python for custom LLM applications. It provides tools that developers need to build state-of-the-art NLP systems. And it has two main building blocks, pipelines and components. The components are the smallest building blocks. They can do one thing, but they can do it very well. And by connecting components, I can create a pipeline. And we'll now create a generative question answering pipeline together with Haystack. Yeah, oh, okay. It's a bit out of range here, but yeah. Um, so this is how generative question answering pipeline looks like in Haystack. Yeah, sorry about that. So uh, we have the retrieval part here. So it's like embedder and retriever together. And then we have the generative part, which is like prompt builder and the generator. So what we do here is basically we have a query. So in my example, it was like, what is the story of Python Pizza Conference? And by using the embedder, I generate an embedding, text embedding for that query. Then Retriever goes and create, goes to the vector database and gets the relevant information. And I mean, you can think this as the context that I copy pasted from the, uh, from the website of Python Pizza Conference. And then Prompt Builder, it is supposed to be there. Prompt Builder uh, generates the prompt and the generator which is this part is just uh, sends the prompt to one of the large language models you can find uh, out there. And then uh, in response, I get an answer. Oh my God, this is very big. All right, <laughs> let's see the code of this. So remember I have a text embedder and text embedder you can use like 
uh, here I use the sentence transformers, but as I said, you can use also like open AI models, cohere models, like any embedding models. Um, retriever is basically depends on what type of uh, vector database you want to use. Um, and in the template you see, I explain LLM what to do. And but I also see like you see the curly brackets there. They, these parts are going to be filled by the retrieved documents, retrieved relevant documents, and also by the question that, I, that the user asked. And the builder builds the prompt, so like puts the relevant information into the prompt, and the generator sends this prompt to Hugging Face, because I trust Hugging Face, and then they also you define the model name, but I mean, you can see, you, just, you can just see that it's Google's Flan model. And this is how you create the pipeline in Haystack. A bit, what I do is basically like adding components to my pipeline, then connecting these components to each other, and then, then I just run the pipeline and it's ready. Now, what, what this one does is basically when I ask a question, it goes to my database, gets the relevant information, generates the prompt, sends it to the LLM, and gets a response. So basically what I manually do, did with ChatGPT. Um, thank you. That was it. You can find me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and on top, on down left, you'll also see the Twitter account of Haystack. So we are also sharing a lot of information there. And yeah, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, we can talk over the pizza. Hopefully, this. <laughs> So that's all folks for today. It was, no, I'm kidding. This is all for before the break. And then uh, we are going to wait for pizza with or without patience. You have to think about like the little boy, right? Which is growing up. So it's now a young man having a bike. The wind is blowing again through Hamburg. Ooh, Jessica says that's how the wind does. And there is again the strange noise it could <laughs> this um i mean the noise could be that pizza is coming but they did say the pizza is coming at 12 30. so uh we can yeah it's like in four minutes what time zone are you <laughs> oh, 4 30 no oh no yes so everybody can go and enjoy some water. It's <laughs> hydrating, it's very healthy. You can also drink juice or mate, coffee, tea. Say hi to Arthur who arrived. And we will be back at, wait a second. We are going to be back in two hours. Two twenty something, yeah. Two twenty.
Christian. Okay, so yeah, so everybody's back. When, so the kid ate a lot, right? Ah, uh, right. I hope everybody new at home bike, also. New noise. Well, no, not new no, noise. It's, not... it's the same noise, but again, imagine like hearing the same thing in a similar location after three, four years. Yeah. What do you do in that situation? You use the bike. You use the bike and you go up again. How long do you think it took the kid to go up the hill now with the bike and not with a tricycle? It was like, okay, so who doesn't remember? It was four hours before four with the tricycle? And with the bike, how and much? Short legs, right? No, the legs are a little bit longer. One hour and a half. Okay, one hour and a half. Can be. I'm really wondering how tall the mountain is going to be. So, yeah. And things change in three years when you know, there was some issue with the mountain or whatever, but the path was still not really uh, safe. So the most important thing is that he's not taking a train to get there, right? Because <laughs> that's a problem. There were some days. cancellations with the Deutsche yeah, Bahn. Yeah. Deutsche Bahn uh, strike and everything. Yeah. Okay, so the kid gets up to the mountain, right? Yes. And nice. then? And then? And knocks on the knocks on the door, right? Oh yeah, there's. <laughs> For the same price, you have here. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> but this time it was like a complete surprise. Instead of being the monk who opens the door, it was Torsten. <laughs> so there we go. So you need to click here. So. Yeah. Good, perfect. Thanks a lot. So. Yeah, hello also from my side. Um, I'm Thorsten, I'm working at Honeypot. And basically, yeah, today I want to talk about developer salaries. And I guess it's all of interest to you. I hope you're still, you know, in a phase where you can still listen because after the pizza, you might be a little bit, you know. Uh, and I especially had this um, like pizza which said mushroom and I thought it's like, yeah, it's a mushroom. What can go wrong? There was so much garlic on it. So I'm, <laughs> I'm happy that you're a little bit more far distant from me. So and excuse me, that's basically it wasn't my fault. <laughs> OK, but <laughs> cool. But let's uh, now dive into the topic, right? First of all, maybe you were wondering why is Honeypot able to talk about developer salaries? So I briefly want to explain what we do so you understand also why we, in fact, can talk about that topic. So Honeypot is a platform which is specialized on tech recruiting. So basically, we bring together um, talents who are looking for a job with clients and all in the tech space. So it's really focused on uh, tech people. We were founded in 2015 um, and are now part of New Work. So therefore, yeah, this wonderful building also. We belong to that company now. And we are based in multiple um, yeah, cities, basically. And we have clients in Germany, Austria, Spain, Switzerland, Netherlands. So quite a lot. And we already helped over 2,500 tech talents to find a new job via Honeypot. So how does it work, basically? So um, how Honeypot works is you create a profile on our website and tell us what you want. So what kind of tech you're interested in, what um, kind of companies you're interested in. Is it startups? Is it like bigger companies? So basically, what is it? And then you get a free personal talent success advisor, so a real person, a real human being who basically guides you through this application process and makes sure your CV looks good and like basically everything is top notch and that you also receive the best offers. And what then happens, it's a little bit of a different process. So you are not applying to companies, but companies apply to you. So they make the offer and they always share the salary and tech stack up front. So you exactly know what you're getting into. And in the end, you're just selecting from the offers you get. OK, that's the one where basically I want to find out more. And then you get in touch with the company. And as you already have seen, it's like we, the companies share the salary up front. So we know all the salary um, data from the company. So what they, are they offering to the talents which are on Honeypot? But on the other side, also, we ask the developers, OK, what kind of salary do we expect um, to get in your new job? So we have all the data about the talents who want to get a new job and also about the companies, what they offer. And therefore, basically, we can uh, now talk about a little bit, um, yeah, what does it look like and basically cluster it by different kind of dimensions. If you want to know more about Honeypot, we have also a little booth there with a lot of swag. So we want to play cards against uh, developers. You're free to join uh, later on. So the first fact here, basically. Um, what you can see here in yellow is the offered salary by the company. So what is the company willing to pay? And what is the expected salary? So what does the developer want to get? 
And you can see that there is basically kind of a gap between what the developer wants to have and what the company is offering. Obviously, average value, average um, values here across um, all the kind of tech, tech positions we have on the platform. But what you can basically see is usually developers expect less than what they are offered. So that means it is really good if you negotiate. So there is room for you to get a higher salary, even though maybe you are a little bit like, ah, maybe can I really ask for that? Yes, you can. And you should start a little bit higher. Then what you can also see here that from 2022 to this year, basically to today, the increase in salaries is not as steep as it was the years before. This is basically due to the economic slowdown we are now experiencing. So we also see that in the data that basically salaries for developers are not rising crazy, but they are still, you know, going up. And compared to other industries, it still looks really good here in, uh, in the developer community. Now going to, okay, to the question, okay, work in which country should I work? Um, you can see here basically the, um, the average salaries for the different uh, countries. So for example, for Austria, Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands, Spain, obviously here, Switzerland sticks out. You can earn quite a lot of money in Switzerland, right? But you also always have to put it in perspective. If you live in Switzerland, also everything is super expensive. If you have been to Zurich once, for example, like a dinner costs like over 10 euros or so, and you're like, what the hell? So basically what I also attached here is the price level index. So this is 160 for Switzerland. So basically 100% is like German price um, level. And then you can basically see the difference. And do you see basically that you are not like, in, in fact, in Germany, you're better off because it is way more expensive to live, live in Switzerland. And the average salary is not like so much higher compared to Germany. So Germany is in fact a quite good place to be a developer in. That's um, it's kind of the key takeaway from, from this slide. And if we now drill down into Germany, so which kind of um, cities or locations in Germany are the best to work in? It's a little bit surprising, in fact. Um, you get the most salary, in fact, in Berlin and compared to other cities on average, obviously, right? So Hamburg, in fact, is the, the lowest one where we are today. Maybe because <laughs> Hamburg is such a nice city, everyone wants to live here anyways, right? No, but um, basically the main reason for that is that in Berlin, the competition is just like super high. Like a lot of companies are battling for tech talent and not everyone is full remote yet, right? So the salaries in Berlin are just higher because there is so much demand from companies still. And yeah, this data is all for 2023, right? Um, or for, um, so for the current time, basically. So um, yeah, this might also change over time, but that's uh, how it currently looks like. If we now look at what kind of company sizes um, like influence the salary of uh, developers, um, you can see that like the biggest salary, in fact, you get for this medium sized companies from 50 to 250 people. And you get lower salaries, in fact, for smaller companies and also for bigger ones. Um, reasoning is a little bit that smaller companies just can't afford really big salaries, right? So they are like a limited, they have a limited budget, what to pay for software developers and big companies. They basically attract people because of their name, because people want to have the name on their CV, you know, so they basically do not have to pay so much. Obviously there are the Googles of the world who pay crazy salaries, right? But in average, like companies over 250 people, they pay a little bit less. So the sweet spot is really like this companies 50 to 250 um yeah to employees however obviously that also depends highly on the company i'm pretty sure there are also companies who pay less and who pay more but that's um, always average values looking at the gender salary gap yes there is still one so we looked here at women versus men basically so what are the average salaries of women and on the bottom you basically see the years of experience the person has so if it's like low experience, just zero to two years, and then up to nine years plus. Um, yeah, the sad thing is you still have quite a gap, especially in the beginning of the career for women. They really do not earn the same money when, they, when they're starting out. But the kind of good news I would say is at least later on, you know, the salary is comparable. So if you have more than seven years <laughs> of experience, we can see in the data that then you also have like the same um, like salary here, but obviously still we have to work on that. Like this gap there is being closed 
in the end because it should be like one line and not like two lines in the end. <coughs> and then one last um, effect basically, and this is like a bit more uh, comprehensive on, on this slide. So you basically can see here the different salaries you get in different positions. So back end, DevOps, front end, full stack, tech lead. Um, and then depending on the amount of experience you have, so also like the years of experience, what kind of salary um, are you getting? But not only that, you can see, basically see here, what do you basically um, expect to get as a software developer in this kind of seniority level and in a certain position, but also what is then being offered. So how to read this? So yeah, the pointer, ah, it, it works, but you can't see it on the screen because it's so, so bright. You see it in black, but not on, on white. Anyways, but um, as a back end, for example, with no experience, you would love to get 54K as a salary, but in the end, you're getting 61K. So you're getting way more than you were expecting. And as a tech team lead with nine years of experience, you would love to get 89K, but in the end, you were only offered 83K. So every time there's a red bar, basically, it means you were expecting more, but you got less in the end. And what's, um, what's interesting here is, in fact, in the back end space, if we exclude the tech lead roles, you are pretty well um, yeah, suited. So if you're working on the back end, you usually have like the highest salaries here on average. Obviously, DevOps, you also have pretty high salaries. But most of the time, if you become a DevOps, you were a developer before. So it's maybe also a little bit unfair um, to, yeah, to compare this um, here. And yeah, this is basically, um, I guess, a good overview what the current state of salaries um, yeah, is in the, in the dev market. Obviously, there are way, way more details I haven't shown here. The data was here mainly focused on Germany, but we have also data for Spain, for Switzerland, uh, and so on. So if you want, you can check out our salary report. Um, there's basically way more details in there if you want to drill down. And I also checked, by the way, for Python salaries, if they are like totally different from the backend salaries on average, they closely match. So there's no like kind of a big difference between Python salaries and the developer salaries on average. So um, yeah. If you look at the data, um, it's it's fair to assume if backend is uh, like stated there, it's most likely also what Python developers earn. And obviously, if you're looking for a new job or if you're hiring, also yeah, look look up Honeypot or talk to us later in the day. That's it from my side. Yeah, knocking on doors. What? But now with the bike. Ah, yeah. Well, first of all, he, he left the bike chain outside because you know some bike thieves on the top of mountains. And uh, same monk, but of course a bit older, opened the door. No, that was Thorsten. Ah, and Thorsten got the monk. Yes. Ah. So. And said. I hear the noise again. You might recall me. And then he said, it looks, your face looks familiar. And then he explained again, I really think that I'm ready now to understand what is this noise coming from. Um, the monk said, it's not in Excel, but what is in Excel? It's in Python? It's, it's Python. Alexander will oh tell you more about that. All right. So let's give a warm welcome. Yeah. Ten minutes, right? Ten, right? Not twelve. Yeah. Okay. I will. Two uh, minutes is for the story. Oh, okay. Now I get it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm talking about Python and Excel now. So it's hell no or hell yes. So how? Uh, who am I? I'm Alexander Endorf. I'm. Uh, contributing to multiple Python organizations. I cannot cover really here because we don't have time. Uh, my day job, I also have a day job apart from community. I'm a partner at Königsweg. We are a digital boutique consultancy, work in digital transformation, data strategy, and implementation with open source, and contributing back in the communities of open source is uh, important to us because we use open source also for a business. OK, Python and Excel. So who heard about like this big hype-free month ago 
oh, that's a fact. Yeah, you heard about it. Is it was it something new actually? Because actually not, because there was already Python for Excel. There's a really nice library by Felix, which was XL Wings, where you still had to set up your Python environment, and it could nicely interact with Excel and do a lot of calculations faster and speed up and clean your Excel stuff. But now we have Python within Excel. Like, what wow, the crazy. Yeah, so basically you can run Python code within Excel and there's no need up to set up an environment. And why should this be an issue? Because if you're a programmer, you can set up and maintain environments, start Python. So where's the issue? Actually, maintaining and setting up environments is a big issue for many business analysts and people who are not programming on a daily basis. So I have had multiple approaches to explain what is an environment. For example, I tried to explain in my Python environment to um, people in Frankfurt Finance, asset managers, they have investment universes. And I said, oh yeah, this is a programming universe because it's really hard for them to know they don't are not used to the shell and many other things you need to set up for, to, for as an environment. And actually, I'm not aware of one really regular, I just started with Python user who can really help you setting up an environment without shell interaction, which is hard for many people if you don't do this on a regular basis. So I think that's a good point. Yeah, there's a good reason. Okay, why not include Python now in Excel. So actually, uh, if you have like, I think it's still um, a preview version and it also, uh, I think it's also only on Windows so far, you can have like this, you can go to formulas, insert Python, put Python into an Excel cell. How amazing is that, right? You can have, have like this equals pi function and then this will convert your Excel cell to a pi thing. And you see over there, it's a really nice coding interface up there, right? where you can have like a data frame and it will parse the rows over there and give you a pandas data frame within the Excel cell. So, okay. Um, and then uh, you can do stuff with that. You can use describe and get data out of the data frame. And that's all within Excel. And uh, actually I, this is some more, yeah. You can also like have like, you can have charts and you see if you press control enter, the fun effect is here. Um, that somebody from Microsoft and Windows is actually pushing, so, hey, yeah, you need shortcuts, which was, used to be a Mac thing, like, right? <laughs> so, but you need to uh, control enter to execute the cells, and then it's busy, remember that, and then it will plot you a nice plot with Matplotlib. So, and that's not too bad. So, we have batteries included, actually. You have pandas, Matplotlib, stats model, NumPy, and Seaborn included already. Um, so, um, you can do more stuff. So this is like the initialization here. All right, you have a data frame within your uh, um, an Excel sheet. And then you have also calculation logic from left to right and top down. So if you want to access your data frame in um, over there in E, in column E, it won't be available. Yeah, it will give you an error. Okay, that's also like really nice, isn't it? So actually, this is how I basically feel about it. So given the background, also working with clients, hey, it's troublesome to set up environments. And if you do want to some quick and dirty number crunching within an Excel sheet, because your data is in an Excel sheet anyway, I think this can enable users. But actually looking at the implementation and how it works, I said, whoa, that's, that's, that's crazy. But I asked Twitter, actually, which is now X, by the way. Now, um, so I said, OK, if I ask my Python bubble, which is, data engineers, people who care about software quality and good engineering, but I said, okay, let's make this like, ask everyone there. And basically, yeah, the verdict was hell yes. Even, even like 30% said, oh yeah, this is heaven. And only like 68% said, oh no, hell. And of course, there's a huge hype going going on there. Um, and uh, and if you can do, if you can even like do more stuff, you can like really like write like even bigger pro programs there. Um, there's also some useful stuff you can do. For example, this is like an example where you can also do like date parsing. And this, uh, there, this is something I would say, okay, this can be useful um, here to say, okay, you could, it's easier to parse in date than using the built-in functions in Excel to um, um, separate text. But Python and Excel, what's, my, what's like the verdict? You probably guessed a little bit from my tone and me caring about software quality. Let me introduce you to the sizes of Community. So actually, like the 
according to Statista, the JavaScript community is like 17 million and Python, we are like number two with like almost 16 million people, like Python users worldwide. Now, uh, if you look at Excel, Excel has 70, 50 million users. So that can use Python now. I think this is great news because we're dominating now. We have now <laughs> 70, <laughs> more than 70, 50 million Python users worldwide. So, hey, it's JavaScript. You can never, like, it's impossible to reach. Yeah. So this is one thing. And I think always don't forget, all, it, it will also enable people. But actually, my, my verdict actually here is, yeah, that's another nice example to parse URLs. You can have regex now. This would be like very complicated to do this within Excel without any other macros and everything. So it can enable user for data cleaning if you don't want to set up a, something bigger. But I really want to point to the danger zones because there's a, like we have in Excel, there's also like VBA scripts and macros and they are already hard to maintain. And, and because if, you, if we go to clients very often, people try to solve things and all they know is spreadsheets. So they use the tools they know and they use spreadsheets to do all the analytics and everything. And there's like extensions and everything. And things get really messy and unreliable because this is not really built for proper data engineering and software engineering. And now Python in Excel, if you look, you, you store Python code within cells. There's not even like a proper code editor in there. It's not better. It's making things worse, actually. Yeah, and anything beyond simple, quick and dirty um, uh, code analysis. So it would be MS Cool D analysis. Then, um, fun fact: you know what MS DOS means? MS DOS Microsoft Quick and quick, Dirty Operating System. Actually, um, this is true. Um, I learned that. So anyway, so anything beyond simple, once you push enter, it's legacy already. Yeah. So, and there's limited scalability. Because we will have situations, yeah, but it works in my Excel file, and you have very limited reusability. Your chaos, you can re import data in your Excel sheet, but hey, who guarantees you already you pass all lines? Who will tell people about type safety and how pandas handles data? Or like 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 date parsing, for example, US date parsing. So people will just go and stack overflow, use open um, uh, chat GDP to get some code into Python. And this is, I think, quite, this is not really reliable what comes out there. And one more thing, the code is actually executed in the Microsoft Cloud, which is not but, yeah, that admissible in, depending in which uh, industry and with, how you regulate it, if that, uh, uh, that's not even admissible. And if you look at, okay, now it's really hard to debug Excel already. If you know, have like these huge chunks of Python programs within X, one Excel cell, yeah, debugging will be really fun, right? Um, so, and there's more like uh, quality and reliability. Yeah, so Excel is Excel shadow IT, as we call it, is already a big issue because people try to solve problems they don't cannot program, so they use the tools at hand, as I said earlier. So Python in Excel will just add to that. But it does not really offer to any fundamental solution for data problems, unfortunately. So I wish everybody who wants to use Python in Excel good luck. Yeah, don't get me wrong. If it solves your problems and it can it, it enables you faster, that's great. And I'm I'm the biggest friend, but really take care and still good luck again. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, hi everybody, my name is Mary. I'm a senior data scientist at Wiley, and I work primarily with academic um, data, so titles and abstracts, stuff like that. Um, and I'm going to share a few things that I learned from a multi-label data annotation product, project um, that almost made me lose my mind. So uh, what is data annotation? Honestly, it's simple. It's just giving labels to things. Those things can be text, uh, they can be tweets, they can be article titles, they can be topics, um, they can be maybe sentiment classification for the reviews of the Berlin airport. This is actually a real um, review that I used here. Um, and, um, and so essentially data annotation is just the part of the project where you're providing um, your pieces of data with labels um, that you think make sense. Why is data annotation important? Um, so what we've learned since, uh, since ChatGPT has come out that is that LLMs in isolation are usually not enough. Um, they are called large language models for a reason. They're trained on very, very large um, non-task specific data sets. And so they can be really good at general things, but we're finding out um, that they can be not so good at very task specific things. Um, and so what we've also learned is that labeled data improves the quality um, of the output that we get from LLMs and that actually a lot of LLMs are trained on labeled data. Um, well, they're, they're trained on large sets of unstructured data, but then there's a process of continually refining, labeling the outputs of these LLMs um, to make them smarter. One, uh, one very important um, ex instance of data annotation for LLMs is called adversarial testing or red teaming. And so essentially, and this was taken from um, and chat GPT's uh, technical response. So this is them um, essentially feeding, uh, feeding inappropriate prompts to a large language model, getting a response, and then labeling that response as appropriate or inappropriate, or maybe even borderline, and then using that data, feeding it back into the model to make a model that hallucinates less, that spews out um, less toxic output, and that is just ultimately um, more accurate and more factual. So why is multi-label data annotation so hard? I could put 10 or 15 different bullet points on this screen and it took me a while to, uh, to actually narrow it down to the most important ones. Um, but first things first, uh, when you're doing multi-label, that means that there are more than one there's more than one right answer, or there can be, um, for each piece of data that you have, as opposed to multi-class, which is more like multiple choice, where you're just picking, um, yes, this image or this piece of text belongs to only this class and not another. And so because of this, um, annotators get tired. Mm -hmm. Annotator fatigue is very real. And the more labels that you have, um, the, the more that the annotator really has to think each time they're labeling um, a given answer. And depending on how many, um, how, many how many pieces of text or images or um, instances of data that you're giving your annotators um, to label, that also has a huge impact on this as well. And another reason is that a lot of times conceptually class labels can overlap. Um, so this can, this can mean one, that, um, that um, uh, class labels can overlap. Oh, this means that conceptually they can overlap. So maybe you actually have two different class labels that are too similar. Um, and they conceptually overlap with each other, and that's confusing the model. Um, and so you can also have issues where class labels can be conceptually different, 
but they tend to co-occur with each other. Um, so for instance, if you're labeling something um, with emotion sentiment and you have something that is, you are, you're labeling a piece of text that is sad and anxious, um, a lot of times those two types of class labels can occur at the same time, which can be confusing for the model. And finally, this is the sum total of what I learned from my big annotation project is that more labels, more problems. Um, the more labels you have, um, the more labels you have, the more annotators you have, and the larger your training set is, all of these factors um, interact with each other. And each time you add just, you increase one of those ingredients a little bit, the, the difficulty of the task grows exponentially. And so how can you stay sane when you're doing a multi-label data annotation project? The first thing I recommend is to craft succinct label definitions. And so this means first and foremost, and this is probably my most important piece of advice, um, you need to choose your labels wisely. And this means not choosing too many labels. Perhaps the client or the end user wants to have a certain number of labels or is very, very attached to them. Um, my suggestion is to look at the data set ahead of time and see, okay, does the data really match these assumptions? And do we think that we can classify for these labels? And my second piece of advice for this is that good definitions have at least four key components. And the more specific you can make them, the better it's going to be. Um, so the four specific components are a definition, um, includes and excludes, and then specific examples. And the whole point of this is so that the annotators can look in one place and when they, they are um, trying to label something that might be a bit of an edge case, they can refer to the documentation and they can at least get an idea of what the right label will be. And as you can see here um, with a class label like sustainable energy, this, this is um, class labels in general are very subjective and they're up to interpretation. Um, and so you wanna make it as clear as you can anticipate edge cases ahead of time and bake those into your definitions. Um, communicate effectively with annotators. Um, this is pretty easy. Provide top-notch documentation, which includes um, really easy to read instructions. And scheduling a kickoff call, I would, rem I would recommend having a call between all of the annotators being prepared to answer any questions that they might have. Um, and giving all the same information to everybody at the same time. Finally, um, be prepared for when annotators have questions that arise during the project. And like I said before, you want to be able to anticipate the types of questions that people are going to ask and the types of edge cases that are going to exist. And you want to make sure that you're giving all of the same information to the annotators to standardize things as much as possible. Finally, troubleshooting underperforming models. Check for multi-label class imbalance. As I alluded to earlier, um, specific class labels can co-occur with each other quite commonly. So maybe the more, um, maybe you're trying to get to label 100 sad texts. Um, that might also ratchet up uh, the number of texts that also have an anxious um, label as well, which can sometimes um, create an imbalance when you're trying to create, when you're trying to label a specific number of examples for each class. Um, I alluded to this before, check class overlap, both conceptually um, and realistically. Evaluate the impact um, of the type of model that you're using. There's lots of different models that you can use for multi-label classification. Um, I personally recommend looking into SetFit, which is a few-shot classification model, if you're interested in that. 
Um, and also consider adding more labeled examples. Um, sometimes we just don't have enough data. Sometimes specific class labels don't have enough data. Um, and so just um, keep in mind that it can be helpful even adding 100 or 200 more examples can really help the model converge. And finally, this is my favorite one, consider deleting class labels. Um, and you, you get to make this decision as the person who is building the model. And um, I had to cut three labels from a 17 um, multi-label classifier. And I only wish that I had cut those labels earlier. They didn't end up being that important and it didn't affect the integrity of the model. So um, with that, I thank you. Um, these are some of my side projects. I have a new blog on generative AI and I will be posting a more in-depth article um, that uh, uh, following this presentation. Thank you. So good. What do you do when you are a teenager and then you get shut down again for a second time? So the monk went st stare, st stare straight to the eyes of the guy said, I cannot tell you where the noise co is coming from because you are not a monk. Gain the same, same answer. What do you do as a teenager with that? You rush out and say, okay. Let's forget it. And the guy started to go downhill. Is he fast enough? With the bike, yes. Yeah. It's downhill. So yeah, it was a really clear day, but he was really sad and everything. And but suddenly he remembered their stories, right? About Snow White and Exactly. The seven dwarfs. And, and now Johannes. And then Johannes will maybe help us yeah. to clarify that. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah. Um as I said, I'm Johannes. I'm a data scientist at Celebrate Company. Um, I've got an office here in Hamburg. Actually, it's not that far at Baumwall. Um, I'm also a Hugging Face fellow. That's why I wear this shirt today. It's like a nice emoji. Um, yeah, I see the CV study group on the Discord. You can hop in if you want. And today, I want to tell you a story. So basically, you might know the story of Snow White, right? And um, I really like to create images with generative AI, right? So you will see a lot of stable diffusion images. And because I like to create it so much, we get a quick run through the original story. OK, so probably you know there was a young princess, really beautiful, but her mother died in childbirth. So her father married again, but the new queen, she was evil, right? An evil witch, basically. And she wanted, wanted to be the most beautiful in the whole country. So she had to get rid of Snow White. Luckily, Snow White can escape, runs into the forest, runs, 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 until she comes to a hut and falls asleep. Wakes up again, seven dwarfs around her, and she goes like, eh, probably good enough. Queen won't find me here, right? Well, she's wrong. Queen finds her, disguises as an old woman, sells some apples, one is poisoned. Snow White bites into the apple, falls dead. Or so you think, until a beautiful prince comes along on his mighty steed, right? Kisses her and she wakes up again. Oh, so great. And yeah, he takes her away to his kingdom and they live happily ever after. That's the original story, right? And as I'm like, well, happily ever after. But what about after some years, Snow White gets bored? You know, it's like living in the castle for ages, just sitting there doing stuff like, I don't know, reading books, which is nice, right? But after some years, you get bored. So she thinks, what could I do with my life? And she decides to enroll into the fairy tale university. Right? A really nice <laughs> university building they have there. That's like the best university in the whole fairy tale country. And she decides to study data science, <laughs> of course. So now she studies a lot. She works hard. And in some winter, she decides to take a break and go and visit her old friends. Uh, so she packs her stuff, right? It's all stuff in the backpack and visits her old friends, the dwarfs in their hut. So who are the dwarfs? 
uh, that was the most fun part to create actually <laughs> so there are diggy peppy glimmer gizmo flint picker and russell right those are the seven dwarfs not like in disney we, we forget about disney here right so, um as a german i like the grim fairy tales better than the disney fairy tales so uh yeah so that's just dwarfs but what do the dwarfs do all day you might know that they work in a mine so in the mine they get a, a lot of stones gemstones coal whatever they find right so they take the stones they found found and then they have to sort it they have to sort it to crest basically all these boxes here and then they sell it off to specialized vendors so they've got like one box <laughs> for for ruby they've got one box for diamonds one box for i don't know topaz whatever and yeah then they give it to the ruby vendor to the whatever vendor um but they've been doing this for ages right so like snow white was sitting in a castle they've been just doing this stuff for ages and they get bored and so the quality declines right they just like oh yeah this is probably this, this is that and not every dwarf is as good as the other dwarf at like sorting stuff and they tell this to snow white and she's like wait i study data science i might be able to help you you know I, i've heard about this thing it's simply called voting Ah, uh -huh. okay the dwarves they don't know much about democracy or whatever so <laughs> voting that's something new for them um there's something called hard voting so snow white takes a stone up there the red stone says like okay what is this and every dwarf just says like oh yeah it's a ruby amethyst ruby garnet amethyst ruby ruby then you just collect the votes say okay four times ruby two times amethyst one times garnet so we say it's a ruby that's the winner here that's hard voting pretty simple right Data science is very simple, as you see. Um, now there's another kind of voting we call soft voting. So she says, uh, tell me again, what is this and how sure you are? And what else could it be? Right, so everyone goes like, okay, out of these three, yeah, this is the percentage, then we average over all these. And then again, we get a ranking and we can say, okay, Ruby is still a winner. Okay, so the 12s are not that bad actually, but some are quite unsure and some are a bit like, ah. So with the soft voting, you get a more detailed look at the whole stuff. Now, when you study data science, you also learn about programming a bit, right? So Snow White goes to her laptop and she, of course, knows the sklearn package, scikit-learn. I guess most data science know it, right? One of the best packages, maybe the data science package in Python. And you can also do voting there. So you create some classifiers, whatever, have some mock data, X and Y, and then you just go there, voting classifier, you put in your estimators, blah, 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 whatever they are. And then you just say voting hard or soft. And that is it. In just a few lines of code, you can fit and then predict it. Okay. So that's like really simple. And what we're talking about here is called ensemble learning, right? So it's like a lot of classifiers together. And these could also be like seven decision trees, like the dwarfs. The dwarfs are basically decision trees. They say, all right, it's probably this because it doesn't look like this or that. So every dwarf can be seen as a decision tree and you could put in seven decision trees, but it gets more sophisticated. So there's bagging, right? So bagging is when you take some stones out of your original data set, right? And um, yeah, you take some stones, so not the whole thing, but some stones and you give these stones to the dwarfs, All right? And you do this one by one basically because and the first dwarf is finished, like looking at them, learning from them, he puts the stones back. Then the next dwarf gets some stones so we can always put them back. Um, so they can actually overlap these sub samples, we call them, right? And then every dwarf learns from these stones. And so every dwarf has seen some different stones and they all have like a different idea for classification. And then again, you show them like the redstone and are like okay what is this and they make a guess um and then you average over all their uh, outputs basically that's called begging um yeah and for this averaging here you can actually use voting for example as we've seen before so you can combine it right begging and voting um and of course you can do it in sk learn again really simple just this one line the begging classifier and you can also like tell them which estimators to use but by default, it will use decision trees. So here it uses 10 decision trees, got some mock data, and that's all you need for it, actually. Okay. 
there's one more thing that is called boosting, especially other boost. Okay, so boosting and bagging are like the most popular uh, ensemble techniques actually. And other boost is a bit more complicated because we have our data set and we give that to the first dwarf. The first dwarf makes a guess is about 80% right. Okay, so now we know what he knew and what he didn't know. So we update weights. And the weights are basically attached to every stone. We now know, okay, this one is a hard example because this, the dwarf was wrong about it. So that is more important for the next dwarf. And you see samples where you say, okay, the, the dwarf was right about it, so it's not that important for the next dwarf. So we just basically attach this label to every stone in the data set. And then with this weighted data set, we give it to the next dwarf, which also makes it guess and it's like 70% right. Okay, so basically every dwarf sees a different, well, sees the same data, but with different weights. So again, all the dwarfs learn a bit different. Uh, some are better than others until we get to the last dwarf. He also knows some stuff, right? Okay, and then there's one more step involved into boosting because we know how good they are, right? If you see, okay, the one with 90%, he is like the best. So he gets most to say in the final vote. The ones that are better just get a higher weight in the end vote so that we can like, yeah, be more sure about their performance. Again, sklearn, really quick, add a boost classifier. There are other boosting techniques, uh, for example, xgboost, which is really popular, works a bit different. Um, but yeah, other boost is really nice to show. That's why I showed it here. And again, just one line really. And that's all you need from the SK Learn package. Okay. And then there's one last thing I want to show you, and that is basically ensembling the ensemble, right? So when you have your boosting ensemble method and then your begging ensemble method, you can create predictions from both of them, right? Give them the data, you get predictions. And with those predictions, you can train and other classifier. So here it's Snow White, for example, and we give her the labels as well, right? And then we just say, okay, now Snow White can learn from these. So you can combine them even further, right? You can like, yeah, ensemble the ensemble, as I said, um, to get even more uh, accuracy. Well, sometimes this gets a bit compute intensive, but really in the age of like large language models and everything, most stuff of that you can run on CPUs, right? So <laughs> it's, it's really like low key. Yeah, and of course that's also an SK learn. Again, you have your estimators, you can just stack them. Then you define the final estimator with logistic regression. And that is pretty much it. Yes, thank you. No questions. Okay. No questions. But in the break, maybe you have some dream-related questions. Or Johannes, thank you. So maybe let's speed up the story a little bit. So the guy just go down to the parent house and uh, time flies. Well, he's almost like uh, 18 now, and the family has a business with a city next to it. And they decided to, why not, uh, maybe you can get a motorbike now. Drop your bicycle, motorbike, and you can help us with our business. So okay, the guy forgets about the mountain or whatever, and then he says, "Okay, I will just focus on this and trying to help my family with this." And then we do some runs here to the city or whatever. But that's going to be really fast. It will the be runs. fast. The I don't know. The... Can you tell me how? I mean, to we have to test up running for these it. runs. Yeah, Luisa can. <laughs> and then maybe Luisa will help us understand a little bit how the those runs can be improved. The so, test runs, test runs. Not, only, not okay. the runs. Testing the first. real runs won't be improved, just the test runs. So, round of applause for Luisa. Uh, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Luisa, and I'm excited to tell you about something that made my daily life better, which is speeding up test runs. Yeah, I have a background in physical oceanography and sea ice physics. And um, I've been working as a backend developer since three years. 
at Site Online. And yeah, today I would like to show you what helped me in my daily life. So what's actually the challenge we are looking at? So if you're doing test-driven development, that means you probably spend a lot of time, yeah, looking at tests, writing tests, and running these tests. So the progress bar is probably your friend or your enemy. And if you develop a new feature for your very awesome application, you need an initial complete test run because your application is probably complex and you have a lot of complicated connections within it. So what do I mean by that? Like complex, what are we talking about? Um, for me and my colleagues at uh, Zeit Online, that means we have two examples here. One is our content management system. Um, that is called Vivi, and it's open source, by the way. You can look it up. Um, it, at the moment, it consists of seven, uh, 75 kilo lines of Python code. There's a lot more in there, but let's just look about Python code. And 200, uh, blah, blah. 28 kilo lines of Python code is test code. So roughly 2,800 tests. Would anyone like to guess how long that takes to run? One initial run? It's 30 minutes. So, and the, so, and also the, it's about 15 years old. So it's, there's, it's interesting. <laughs> I learned a lot. Yeah, the second application I want to talk about today, uh, Renda's um, Zeit.de. Um, it's about 10 years old and the Python code is 52 kilo lines of code and 32 kilo lines of code is test code, 4,200 tests. How long does that take? What do you think? <laughs> oh, that would be hard. Um, no, it's also about 30 minutes. Yeah. So these tests include like everything, right? Unit tests to integration tests. Yeah. And if we want to make our life better, then we want to speed that up. And how do we do it? First, we look at the very, very low hanging fruits. So first, first you know, if you're using PyTest, that starts with collecting all the tests within your application. To do that, it scans all the directories to find out where the tests are located. And the default is it just scans everything, which is unnecessary. So you can limit that. If you've done that, you can always analyze your slow tests by using the duration argument for PyTest. And if you have repositories that are that old, there's probably room for improvement. Good. Now we have maybe slow, um, speeded up our test a little bit, but not by much. So what now? We can cheat. We can just paralyze our tests. And lucky for us, there are plugins that do that. And I want to show you one of them and what that helped with our tests. So, and that is called um, PyTest Xtest. And it's supposed to distribute the tests across multiple CPUs to speed up the test execution. So it's paralyzing it. How does it work? Um, it uses a standard controller worker model. Every worker is basically a mini PyTest runner and that collects all the test items, so functions, pictures, config objects, et cetera, et cetera, and tells the controller, hey, this is everything I've got. What should I do? And the controller says, yeah, number that, like five, you do this. And then, yeah, goes through that. And until the end, you have shutdown and 
you're probably faster than before. So now we just have to install that and say, let's, let's run our test with, I don't know, four workers, right? Uh, not really. So there are luckily not many things you stumble across, at least nothing that is particularly um, new or surprising. First, there's test isolation. So you want your state to be limited to the one test you have and no spillover whatsoever. Then you can um, look at the order of the tests. That's important because sometimes that might make a difference. It shouldn't ever, but it might happen. You can use, for example, another plugin for that, which is PyTest randomly. And in the end, um, you want to look at the amount of tests. You might generate tests automatically within your application. That is also not going to work. So once we've accounted for all of that, we can run it again. What do you think, how much did we gain for our two repositories? How much speed did we gain? Let's assume we have, for the content management system, we use like six CPUs. So six workers, and for the web application, we use four. What do we gain? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some educated guesses? 50%? Well, let's see. These are the results. For the content management system, we unfortunately only gained 10 minutes. But 10 minutes is already like one third. That's quite fine. And for rendering side web, we got 20 minutes. 20 minutes, I can go have coffee. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, I have to work. That's not so good. But yeah. So to conclude, what did we learn with this very short example? That wasn't quite hard. That was actually a straightforward application of a plugin that already exists with no really unexpected problems. We achieved a significant reduction in test execution that helps both during development and during deployment. And then it's worth to look at all your defaults. Defaults are nice, but you might gain something by just simply looking at them. And in addition, maybe you already know that. I hope you already knew that. Test isolation is very important. And the last thing is testing is cool. You should have all already knew that. But maybe you're in data science. Maybe you're like me, like coming from science where nobody actually told you a lot about coding. Testing is really cool. <laughs> I should have known that. Somebody should have told me before. Yeah. So with that, I'd like to thank you. I hope you go home and say, hmm, this is, I can do that. I can do that. Maybe, maybe my life gets better. And yeah. I hope you have a really nice day. Thanks for listening. So a couple of things. Uh, we have a break now. It's a half an hour break, but a few things. First one, I need to get used to. Um, lighting talks, if you want to have lighting talks, it's two minutes long. So whatever you like to do, to share, maybe you just want to Stand here and you know speak in front of an audience and you know practice before a big conference or whatever you can do it here in two minutes. That's the first thing. Second thing is that I hope you're hungry because the second half of the pizzas are out there waiting for you. <laughs> but we thought that maybe you were too hungry and then you also have tiramisu as well. And we thought, come on, the day is kind of like evolving and now we are almost closing in the last. Uh, luck for the conference so we also have some beer and also cold beverage outside so please let's go now outside
And uh, let's be back in half an hour, I think so. That will be it. Okay.
Okay. So welcome back after the break. I hope the people online had also cake and more pizza. Um, we have decided to to come to an end with our story because you know, like, why you know, drag it for so long? So you are probably. You know, you can imagine that a little boy who's now a man now went with his Lamborghini up to the monks and asked them, so what's that noise? And then the monk said, well, you got to be a monk to know. So then he said, like, OK, so what do I have to do to become a monk? Who here has ever thought about becoming a monk? There we go, a couple of people. Yep. I thought becoming a monkey. Monkey. <laughs> yes. Who here has thought about becoming a monkey? Okay, that's more. Okay, so um, after Sarah's talk, so first we start with Sarah's talk, and after her talk, we know more about what you have to do to become a monk. Yeah? Come, Sarah. Tell us first, how do you get from, from Berlin to Hamburg? You got the. Thank you. Am I standing far enough? You can see your face. Oh, yay. Hello. Hi, everyone. Oh, thank you. <laughs> all right. Not going to lie. A little bit nervous. I uh, feel like I'm exposing my soul to you all right now. Um, but hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to my talk on, oh, I'm checking the time, uh, from Berlin to Hamburg, um, why I moved from industry to academia. Today I'm going to talk about my journey as a data scientist, machine learning engineer, and now I'm a faculty member at Lafana University, uh, where I teach them computer science, Python primarily. Um, I'd like to tell you all why I quit my dream job. I was working at Artsy as a machine learning engineer, and I love art, which we'll know more about very shortly. I actually just want to open up the conversation to you all and call out some of the inequalities that I experience, other women are experiencing, other minorities are experiencing. And I'd like to end, hopefully, on a bit of a high, um, what you can do to break the bias. But more importantly, you're all listening to my journey. Um, before I begin, though, I wanted to just start with this quote, or not quote, there's a study by Girls Who Code in 2019, and it says around 50% of women leave tech by the age of 35. Many of them leave due to workplaces being inhospitable. Um, along with other reasons. I have reference of um, the study there. Hi again. Uh, I'm Sarah. This is a picture of me from Berlin. I just moved to Hamburg last month. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. I still haven't visited. <laughs> Thank you. We should be friends. <laughs> um, we st I still haven't visited any of the touristy sites yet, so I'm quite excited. Um, this is from my flat in Berlin. Um, I love art, as I mentioned. I have a little collection. This is a glimpse of my collection. Um, I like tea. I love Python. Uh, that's me sort of on a personal note. Professionally, I've had a crazy career. Um, I graduated in 2011. I only did an undergrad. I studied math and economics. Um, when I graduated, kind of just fell into things, fell into consultancy, fell into insurance. I was programming primarily, though. Um, 2016 is really where my data science career started. This time is where data science stole the buzz. I was like watching Coursera, Andrew Ning's Coursera courses to like upskill myself. I studied math. I loved coding. It felt like the right fit for me. Each job faced different challenges. I started off in London at the gym group. Um, a really interesting place to work, an amazing amount of data. But I was programming in R, and um, the company was spending a lot of money not looking at data. And it's yada yada. There's a story behind every reason, every company that I worked in. In 2017, I moved to Berlin. I worked as a data scientist at HelloFresh. Uh, 2018, I was back in London. I was working at this um, underwear company as a data scientist. 2019, I'm back in Berlin. I'm working as a data scientist at a company called Content Bird. Um, they hired me with a permanent contract, and then they had to like end the funding. And I was like, oh my god, I'm not quitting a job again. So I didn't really quite have a choice. But at this point, as you're seeing lots of different companies, lots of different types of projects, lots of different Tech scats, yeah, tech skills I'm developing. Oh. 2020, the year where I finally become a senior data scientist. I'm hired at a company called Update, which is part of Axel Springer. Um, ah, finally, I've sort of made it. I've received the senior title. That's sort of the dream at this point. I was with a team of data experts. Everything's great. Mm -hmm. Aside from, I'm working with newspaper articles that contain racist and se sexist content. And then I see my dream company, Artsy, my dream company, art lover, 
artsy um, hiring for a data analyst position. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not a data analyst, but I need to apply to artsy. Um, I do apply there and it turned out that they were also looking for a machine learning engineer at the time. So great, I go through the interview process. I am the perfect candidate for the job. I understand the market. I have experience solving these problems. I was just working with recommending um, newspapers at update. I was a perfect fit. I do get hired, as you see, um, but they actually hired me as a mid-level machine learning engineer. So after all this experience that I have gained, I'm hired as a mid-level. Now, you can make your own conclusions about that. That's fine. And I'll go into the story about how I became a senior in January 2022, but I'd like to just re repeat this. I was hired as a mid-level. All right, fast forward a little bit. This, this year, February 2023, I quit my dream job. Um, da -da -da -da. And now I am a faculty member at Lafani University. So I teach computer science um, there along with some creative computing programming courses. I am a technical writer at Real Python. Apparently 1,000 people applied and I was selected. So that was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> and I also manage a boot camp um, uh, for women looking to break into the workforce. But that is my current state. And I'd like to talk more about that. While working full time, I was also lecturing. I was teaching at Karlsruhe University. I was teaching at Berlin International Uni. I was teaching at Berlin uh, Tech, you know, uh, sorry, T Tech TU Berlin. I have been really, really, really working for the last few years. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is my journey. It's a bit all over the place. This is a profile of the person that was hired as a senior machine learning engineer, Artsy. Not hired as a mid-level, then promoted, hired as a senior. I'm not saying this candidate's profile isn't worthy of being a senior, but my profile was equally as worthy of being a senior, if not more. Um, they graduated and they didn't study comp science, anything like that in 2016. They had some experience working as a data, data science engineer for a year and a half. They started their own company with two years experience. So that's three years at that point. And then they hired a senior machine learning engineer. Not a mid-level and higher, they were hired as a senior machine learning engineer. Fine, like I said, totally, totally worthy candidate here. But I was equally as worthy. But that must only be my story, right? Along my journey, I have seen so many <laughs> extraordinary women just being sidelined. Um, again, I don't want to, you can do the, uh, check the dates and figure out the company yourself, you're super curious. But here on the left-hand side, you have um, a female candidate and here you have a male candidate and where it highlights the boxes of the company that we all work in at the same time. And the female candidate starts off at a PhD student, both of them PhD students, but the male candidate joins a company as a data engineer, is promoted to a senior data engineer after a year and a half, is then the promoted to a data team lead, and now is a data team lead at another company. This is this person's story. A female candidate who also completed the PhD around the same time, joins the same company, but guess what? As a junior data scientist, becomes a data scientist finally, three years in, and is still hired as a data scientist in the next place. So it makes me a little emotional. <laughs> For sure, data scientist versus data engineer, we can argue maybe the tracks are slightly different. What about these profiles? Both data scientists, both started as interns. Um, this candidate doesn't put, um, again, male, uh, sorry, female versus male profile. They both intern at the same company for six months, but again, the person who gets hired, the, the female starts in a junior role, whereas the male candidate gets, starts off as a data scientist. She finally becomes a data scientist a year later. Three years later, she's a data scientist in another company. And a year and a half later, uh, three years off, sorry, a year and a half still in, she's still a data scientist. Whereas a male candidate goes from intern to data scientist, the data science in another place, senior data scientist, senior data scientist, in half the amount of time. Like so many women, we hit the glass ceiling. It's not even like we hit the glass ceiling. 
we are constantly pushed. <laughs> we go down, then we go up. And I'm not talking about mothers. I'm not talking. I, I, none of these women, by the way, are mothers. All of them relatively uh, in a no commitment side from work type women. Let's put it like that. Um, but we are constantly forced to start below or start as a junior or a mid-level and then work our way back up. Oh. Um, I feel like I'm sort of at time, so I just wanted to wrap with, I did get promoted a senior because I flagged this issue, but then I still had to prove myself. I was um, still had to prove myself. And then once they promoted me, when I asked, could I be considered for another round of promotion? Because the type of work I was doing was having impact on the whole company. Out of a company of 200 people, I was known by pretty much everybody. I don't think a lot of engineers can say that, but I was working and recommending artworks and I um, was having a huge commercial impact. And also technically the work I was doing was crazy. And I kept just getting passed up and I'll never understand why. I was nominated for... Um, Women in AI Germany in October last year. I did a conference talk about the work I was doing. I had the most attendees because I was just such a charismatic candidate. Um, I was really the top of my game. Like I said, everybody in my company knew me. But why was I getting passed up? <sighs> Eventually, I think there just isn't much you can do. And I love the work I did. I loved the work I did, but I just didn't feel like I had a choice. And unfortunately, I can't go into much more. So maybe a part two is on the horizon. But what I would like to just end with is it's time to break the bias. And thank you, everybody, for letting me share my story. But just we need fairer hiring processes. We need more transparent promotion practices. We need not just we need equal opportunities. We need to have zero tolerance for harassment. We need to have policies that actually are focused on breaking the bias. We need to hire and listen to managers who actually want to fix the system. And we need to prioritize candidates with diverse skills, not just buzzwords. Thank you for listening to my story about how I had no choice but to leave the tech industry. But I got really lucky and I absolutely love what I do. And it's so much fun teaching students how to program in Python. And I just am very grateful for the life I have right now. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, that was a very brave talk. Just want to ask, how many people here have been passed up on in their jobs? Once. How many people were passed on twice? Three times? <laughs> it's a competition. <laughs> so, OK, cool, yeah. How many men were passed on? Sorry. Why no men, no, no hands raised? <laughs> this just doesn't happen. Okay. So next we have PDF, right? Mm -hmm. Everything is sorted, as you can see on my. Oh, yeah. So. Story. Story, yes. So, as everybody knows, obviously, in order to become a monk, similar to the story before, you actually have to change your life completely, right? You need to go around the world several times. Yeah. If you want to be successful as a monk, you actually have to con count every grass thing in the world and every grain of sand similar to the stories uh, we have in our lives. Yeah, so you really need to, you know, try to really achieve the impossible. So that's what our, you know, little boy who is a man now doing. Mariana? What? Hmm? Are you ready to become a monk? Yes. <laughs> uh, or tell us about the journey, okay? okay you want yes. another laptop? No, just a timer, sorry. Ah, okay. So hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> So today I want to talk to you about how to create a universe from scratch. I hope I'm not uh, over-delivering on this talk. How do I do this? Uh, 
The magic click. Now do it. Uh huh. So this is my personal motivation. Uh, I was interested in seeing uh, how culture develops. Actually, I was interested interested in seeing like if you have, you know, a certain number of agents in a determinate uh, space. Um, how are they going to interact with each other? How are they going to interact with the environment? Um, and that's the reason why I created my universe. Um, but, you know, there are many other reasons out there. Maybe you have like. I don't know, you would like to be worshipped by your creatures or something like that. So, um, so for inspiration, um, earlier this year, came out, um, this paper came out called Simulacra of Human Behavior. And then these people did similar things. Uh, they created this cute universe um, where it's a little village and there, there's little villagers walking around and like living their lives. And each one of them have like, you know, characteristics and stuff. And um, Two things um, motivated me to like want to create my own universe in this uh, in this paper. One of them was the fact that uh, emergent behaviors happened in this uh, in this context. So what emergent behaviors means here is like um, things that the developers didn't program happen. So there, one of the agents, for example, um, they were running for like being mayor of the city, and then they talked to another agent about it, and they, the agent was like, "Yeah, I don't know if I'm gonna vote you." And then he just walked around the, the city and started talking to the other agents about like, oh, have you heard that Klaus is running for a mayor? What do you think about him? And this was like, you know, an emergent behavior. And, and they talked about his um, his um, candidature process, process. And I thought it was pretty cool. And I was interested in what kinds of, what other kinds of emergent behaviors we could see. Um, and there was another fact on this paper that um, bugged me and I wanted to change. So like, for example, they had the environment and then they have like, the, the way the memory worked for these agents is like, they were aware of every single object in the sense of like, oh, this chair is unoccupied or this table is unoccupied. This refrigerator is unoccupied. And this would like be a stream in their memories. And I thought, well, that's not how human memory works. Like that's not how I exist in a room. I'm not thinking about every single thing that's not being used. So I thought I could do um, something different. Okay. So what technologies do you need to create an interesting universe? So first, you need agents, um, ideally with distinct personalities and with a memory. Um, that's very important. They need to remember what happened. You need an environment, a physical space where these agents exist. Physical in a sense, because it's all inside the computer, but um, not a very important thing is time. You need the, you know, if you don't have time, then nothing happens. You can have agents in a physical space, but nothing's gonna happen. So you need time so you can have events and a event um, loop so things can happen. And another interesting thing um, is interaction. So both um, interaction from agents between agents and agents with the environment. Okay, so to do this, I drew from two different research areas. One of them is agent-based modeling. So agent-based modeling is, um, you know, is a very old area and they have uh, this idea um, like several different um, uh, backup uh, instructions on how to make agents interact with the environment, um, like autonomous agents to interact with the environment and how to make the environment respond to them. So autonomous agents is just like, you know, there's no like real underlining code usually um, controlling these agents. They have characteristics and then they just respond to the environment and the environment respond back to them. And the other area of research is this area called cooperative AI, uh, which is my main interest actually. Um, and it's the idea on how can we make AI to both um, interact with humans and with each other. So the cooperative uh, keyword sounds kind of positive, but it's actually a non necessary positive. Uh, you know, they, uh, AIs could cooperate in like negative ways and like fight with each other, for example. Um, coordination would be the, the positive sense of this word. But cooperative AI, um, it draws a lot from game theory, and there's a lot of theory um, about like how to build these interactions that are like very simple, um, kind of like game of life, for example, very simple rules, and then very complicated emergent behavior comes out of it. Okay, so the real tech stack that I use was a large language model that a, a lot of people talk about it today um, in Python and LangChain. So LangChain uh, is just a, a choice of software. 
but it's important that you have something that offers you a framework for highly contextual searches. So one of the most important things on this project is having memory. And uh, it's important for you to be able to search memory in a way of like, you know, kind of like you remember things, like uh, you forgot something. And then like, uh, where did I put, I don't know, my keys? And then you're like, oh, I got into the house and then I took them out of my pocket and I went to the kitchen. So this kind of stuff, this um, contextual search is very important in this sense. Uh, another very important part is the storytelling part. So um, I lived in this um, high-tech, low-life uh, desert for a couple of months called Mars in Southern California. And um, <laughs> yes, this, is, this has to do with the talk. And um, there I met an artist and she has uh, this universe that's very, very complex, but uh, it's about the little Martians, which is the people who live in this place. And she basically gave me a prompt on like, What's the universe that I want to emulate? And uh, my universe was based on this. Humans from distinct, distinct points in his, of history woke up in a colony in the planet Mars together. They don't know why. So that's the, the prompt behind my universe. It's important to have a prompt. It's important to have a storytelling. So then for the environment itself, I created something very simple. It only had like uh, these four different spaces. So it had like, it was a colony in Mars. It had a generator room, a laboratory pods where the agents would sleep and the gardens where they were growing food. And I only had four agents. So um, I tried to come up with names um, that I made up myself and, and some, um, some uh, known figures. So Aluna, and then like, so the characteristics of these agents are like way more complicated than this, but this is compressed so I can explain to you. So she was like, described as adventurous, individualistic, a smart woman from the 23rd century. Copito is a bioengineered half gorilla and half human, anxious and paranoid. And then Hayton is a mathematician, medieval mathematician and Shakespeare. Okay, so then for events, um, so the day, uh, this is the time aspect of it. The day, um, we had one day and then each day had three parts, which was morning, afternoon and night. And then at each part, you had you would have every time these four events happen. So the first thing uh, an agent would do in the beginning of their day would be plan what they're going to do at the, that stage of the day. So they would think like according to their goals and where they are or uh, and the people who are around them, what are they going to do? Then they could choose if, it, if they wanted to change the environment that they were. So if they were the pods, they could go to the gardens and whatever. Um, then they would look around and see who's around them and decide if they wanted to talk to them or not. And only then they would act. Um, and uh, and the, their actions were finally um, uh, affected by all the other events that happened beforehand. Okay, so here are some results. So these are some uh, Copito. Um, he was uh, really, you know, struggling with himself, like, am I a gorilla? Why can't I speak in reason? Why am I so smart, like a human? What kind of sick mind has done this to me? So then at some point, I ran the simulation for like uh, several days and then like in, the, in their universe. And then at some point he got paranoid and thought that there was a project Copito going on. And then he, was like, he tried to research and find like what's his origin. He actually like, so the underlying, um, the thing that was uniting everyone was like, oh, why are we in Mars? But this thing was so strong for Copito that he just like went after pursuing um, where did he come from? And he would also say like things like, oh, I'll die for a banana. Um, okay, so some cool stuff happened in my simulation. Uh, Aluna went into deep cave explorations where she found artifacts and relics from ancient Martian civilization. And that was like really, really cool. Like she, she really has some really cool arcs, uh, story arcs. Hayton and Shakespeare collaborated together in their research to try to find out a way out of Mars. Shakespeare was like a great uh, scientist in the end. And um, Copito actually found out he was an uh, LLM. So there is this parameter in uh, large language models called temperature. And if you raise the temperature, then the language model gets very creative. Like it gets very like wild. Um, and then at some point Copito uh, started to, and I, and I raised Copito's temperature because I thought he was a weird character, so why not? And then at some point he like repeated himself a couple of times, like, uh, I don't know, like, uh, oh, and then I dropped the glass and then I dropped the glass and then I dropped the glass. And then he was like, wait a second, that was weird. Why am I repeating things? 
this is the behavior of large language models. And then he, <laughs> yeah, he thought he was a large language model. Okay, so conclusion. Um, yeah, this was a cool experiment, um, uh, but there are several things that I would like to have done better. So permanent change is one of them. Uh, the agents to have the ability to actually, ability to actually, actually change the world. So all of this behind of this is Python code. So this is kind of like meta programming, and it's really really difficult problem to fix, and I didn't fix it. Uh, but like in the case of Aluna, uh, um, she discovered new spaces. She invented like new you know new things in the storyline, and only her had access to this. Only her memory. If she would talk to someone else, then this person would also have access to it. But it wasn't a real coded thing. So one really cool thing would be like actually you know add the ability the, the, of the agents actually adding new spaces and adding new um, new things to the story. Um, the another thing is that is that um, they're also really better coordinating. So we need uh, better algorithms for them to coordinate and like build cooler things together and a better system uh, improved belief system. So their way of thinking is more accurate. OK, yes, I'd like to thank you. And this is my blog post where um, I talk more about this and also thank Morgan for part of the, the coding. That's it. <laughs> Okay, so so this is well. You wanted to become a monk. Were you part of the people who wanted to become a monk? Yeah. Yeah. Teacher. You too. Okay, cool. I'm so okay. a monk. Ah, you wanted. To be. Okay. So then uh, this one again. Yeah. So our friend, the little the little man, so the young man, ended up going around the world several times by train just to have that extra challenge, yeah? And uh, then he comes back to the monastery and asks about that noise. But first, we actually have to, he also has to take a boat because it's, you know, Hamburg. So, and then we find out what happened. Thank you. Nice, so really great talks. Um, Today um, is my first presentation at an event. So. <laughs> <Bear with me. laughs> so my name is Julie Batista Silva. I'm a software developer at Hoppe. Hoppe Marina is a Hamburg-based company. Um, and we are doing this project there, migrating many repositories to a single unified uh, monorepo. And so this can be a quite a controversial topic, but my goal here is to uh, share experience and talk about why we did this and um, share the difficulties and also some tooling that can help with this task. Um, I don't have so much time here, so I cannot go into too deep or too much detail, but uh, feel free to contact me later or on social media, just search my name. Um, how to use this? Yes. So about Hoppe Marines, for some context, um, we are a Hamburg-based company, so not so far from here. And we develop fluid controls and measurement systems for the maritime industry. So you can see in the picture that we have a lot of sensors and measurement systems that keep ships uh, stable on, in the sea. and. Um, working uh, correctly, efficiently. And we have a lot of customers. Um, I have this information here that one every eight new ship is equipped with at least one of our systems. And that's more than 8,000 vessels now. And they generate a lot of data that we are collecting with those uh, sensors. Some of this data is uploaded to our cloud and it has to be cleaned validated, aggregated, displayed on our web interface uh, called Fleet Data Portal, and also made available to customers so that they can do their own analytics or your dashboards, whatever. And um, this code for transformations and APIs is Python code. 
um, for transformation and analysis, we use pandas, scikit-learn, for example, and for APIs, we are using FastAPI. And each one of those um, pipelines or APIs have its own repository and also utility functions. And this was a good idea. So it made sense in the past, um, but the code base grew and it's, it was growing a lot. Uh, as of three months ago, our very small team was responsible for 56 repos. And as you can see, um, it's not that the APIs and pipelines are um, dependent of each other, they are not, but they share some common, uh, common libraries, internal and external. And uh, that many repos got too hard to test, too hard to keep updated, too hard to keep consistency between the repos and to synchronize dependencies, uh, the so-called dependency hell. It's really bad. And for example, if you want to change a function in one shared library, what do you do? You first clone the repository, you create a virtual environment in your machine, change the function there, run the tests, open a PR, publish a new version of this library in your private package repository, I've used Nexus, find in our repositories where this function is used, clone those repos, create a virtual environment, update the dependence, change the function call, run the tests, open a PR, and repeat recursively. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, th that's a lot of work. That's, and that's not just bad because it is a lot of work, but also because it hides problems. Um, for example, what if you forget one of those repos? What, what's going to happen? Um, well, maybe nothing's going to break because you have versioning, you have a package for that. But in the future, this is going to bite you. And maybe your colleagues will find out and they need to update the version. And then they'll see, oh, OK, there was a change that should have been done before. And then they are going to ask oh, what happened. And then you'll, you lost context of what you're doing. And fixing that later is much harder. Well, what's the solution? In our case, it was a monorepo. And for that, we had to do a feature freeze. So we convinced management. Uh, I'm very glad they, they accepted a feature freeze for some, for some months. And then we started uh, working on a monorepo. But uh, what is a monorepo, right? And the definition I'm using here is a single repository from which multiple packages are published, multiple packages are, are projects. And do not get confused with a monolith. It's a different concept. Uh, I made a drawing there. Uh, Explaining so a monolith is just one package in a multi-repo. You have uh, many Git repositories in a monorepo. You can have them all together in a single repo, and that's the idea. Uh, and did this? Uh, it solved the dependency hell, but not without challenges. Um, for starters, even before doing the the migration, we had to to do some some tasks. For example writing more tests. We need to guarantee that we are not going to break things. Uh, so it's very important, the tests. Uh, Luisa talked about tests. It's really important, uh, even if you are a data scientist. In our case, uh, even more. And we defined a well-organized report structure, also important for organization. We defined code standards and tooling, poetry, rough, PyTest, Docker, pre-commit hooks. And I really recommend take a look at poetry and rough. Uh, really cool technology and we opted for a trunk based development that's the idea of you have short lived branches and you keep committing to a main branch in monorepos it, it makes sense um, well and the biggest uh, challenge in my opinion was deployment so um, we had some CI and CD pipelines and for some context Continuous integration, continuous deployment is when you, for example, commit um, in your Git repository. And then there's a pipeline that runs, tests the code, and do the deployment for you. You don't need to do it manually. Um, so what, what we had in the past was that you merged in the main branch, and it would run the tests, and then um, do the deployment of everything that's there. So it tested everything and deployed everything. But this is silly in the monorepo. You have a lot of code. And if you run every test, uh, 
we don't have resources. Uh, you cannot deploy everything every time. And, and then we need to uh, fix this. So if I deploy one API, I said that they were independent and you, um, you, you did a change in the API. If they are independent, you only need to test that API you changed and deploy that API. You don't need to, to test the other API that has no dependency, it's not related. But if you change, for example, a shared library that uh, two APIs depend on, you need to test the shared library and everything that imports from that shared library. So, um, well, you can write scripts, uh, parsing git diff tree, checking uh, what changed, what depends on what. Custom scripts is not a good idea. Uh, it's too hard to maintain, it's too hard to write, uh, not good. You can check if your CI tool, for example, um, GitHub, GitLab, uh, Jenkins, whatever, Bamboo, uh, has something that checks um, that run different actions for different paths, but this is also hard and um, it's not optimal. Happily, there are better tools, so happy face there, and sad face is they are not always trivial to set up. And here are some of them, um, Bezel, Gradle, so some from Microsoft, some from Google, uh, and they are different. They work with, um, they have some different features and not, of all, not all of them work with Python. Um, the one that caught my attention the most uh, is this one in the corner called Pants, more specifically Pants 2. Um, uh, it was created by Twitter uh, in the past and but now it's maintained by the community. Twitter don't, don't use it anymore. And it's a feature-rich build system. It was developed with Python use cases in mind, uh, also supports other languages. And it do uh, static code analysis and infers a lot about your code. So it checks uh, what is depending on what. Uh, automatically, you can also define rules, not always get right in our experience. Um, but for simple repos, it, it does a really good job. And it's really fast. So uh, not only because uh, of the Rust code, uh, it's rewritten in Rust, but also because it has caching, also remote caching, and concurrency. And it's extendable. And after it's set up, it's quite um, user friendly. It works with goals, so you write what you want to achieve, and then Pants will orchestrate the execution for you. And um, well, in, in another talk, Luisa talked about uh, the tests. I also can talk about tests here. <laughs> um, I said that it has caching and concurrency. So if you run Pants tests and some API, what's going to do is it first uh, check if anything changed. If there was no change in what you are testing, then it simply return from the cache. Uh, a better than optimizing tests is not running at all. So <laughs> then something that takes 30 minutes, you're running zero because it's already in the cache. Um, let's say that you did change something, but in only one API, then it's gonna test only that API. If you change something in a shared library, it's gonna test the library and things that depend on the library. And this is uh, really game changer. This uh, speed up the testing a lot, and it's also remote. So um, this can be shared between developers. Um, the same thing can be applied for other commands. So packaging, you can only package what you changed. You don't need to package everything every time. So it solves the problem uh, I was talking about before. Uh, same for linking and formatting. It, it will call the tool that you configured um, for those tasks. And the same scheme, check the cache, only run what's necessary. Um, I copied this from, from uh, PyCon US from last year. Uh, I really recommend checking that uh, presentation, Chris, uh, Chris Neuberg, um, So here I made a list, a non-extensive list of pros and cons. I'm not gonna go through all of the topics here, but it's really important to see that there are a lot of benefits, but there are also some problems. And um, one of them is 
that it requires this tooling to be really practical. And second is it creates a really large repository. So depending on your company, this can be a problem. Um, I know that a lot of changes in Git were because, for, for example, Microsoft uses uh, monorepos and their Git was blowing up. So uh, Google also had this problem. Many companies had this. For us, it's, it's not much. <laughs> um, and uh, also other problems. So it's important to consider this very carefully. So um, for finishing, lessons learned, they are not a silver bullet. They do bring benefits, but can create new problems. Weight the pros and cons carefully. Uh, can be a lot of work. In our case, it was worth it. There are tools, they are not trivial to set up always. There's a learning curve and you can uh, adopt it incrementally. You can also have a hybrid repo, don't need to put all the code base there from all the teams. It's really important to be organized and you should avoid tight coupling between components. And in our cases in specific, we use AWS Lambda, so you can create Lambda layers, a different uh, topic. So here are some reference, really good. If you want to know more about uh, Hop, uh, monorepos or pants. And that's it. Thank you everybody for watching. <laughs> Thanks for the team that's here and also past members. Okay, so now the moment everybody's been waiting for to, to know what is that noise all about, right? And then, so the, the young man goes to the monk and says, well, actually the young man is now going around the world by tr with the German train for so many times. It's no longer a young man. It's probably like the old man. So he's like, let's see how this works. Ooh, it's working. And then I have to accept cookies or reject them. Accept, I have to accept them? No. <laughs> close. So oh. it just, uh, it's your auto running it. Just yeah, close. I can't. It doesn't let just me. Here's gone. Wait, I do this. Technical issues. <laughs> As you can see, because of the cookies, it doesn't uh, just reject. No, it's taken over. <gasps> quit. Force quit. I don't quit. want to quit all of it. Okay. Force quit. Okay, so basically, the. Basically, it's it. Thank you. <laughs> Just a second. Uh, MacBooks. So, yeah, so basically, the monk says. I'm sorry, but you actually have to have some patience. Before you find out what the noise is about, you need to watch one more talk. So what you can do is do share, press share.
we have Georgie, who is going to also make some noise. And yeah, I want the control. It's working. Yeah. So is it left or right? If you want to go left, you have to pick left. And if you want to go right, I have I have problems with direction. Okay, got it. Just try it. Yeah. So hi everyone. Um, my name is Georgie. As you can see, there's nothing else about myself here except the cat. Um, if you want to follow me, you don't need to follow me. <laughs> but um, I'm in um, Macedon and also X. The reason why X has a one is because um, I lost the key to my X. So I have to add another one and create a new account. Um, yep. So anyway, um, question, just to address to Sarah just now with the talk. Um, where's Sarah? Oh, hi. Uh, fun fact, I joined the tech industry after 35. So you can guess how old I am. And uh, my first computer related um class is um ms dos 5.0 that also tells you how old i am thank you <laughs> and i also have kids so i fit in all the boxes that is um the minority weird shit. <laughs> so anyway hey it's not working it's not working because i clicked on the phone yeah it's not working. yeah so I'm actually um, in the board of directors among all these people here, the 12 of them. And it's, um, this is the first year that I'm joining uh, along with um, Denis, Hong Guan from Korea, um, and a couple, who else was new this year? And me, one, two, one, two, three. I need my fingers to count, one, two, three. And Chris would rejoin, so there was four um, new faces this year. So basically, apart from uh, serving Python Software Foundation, I'm also in a DNA work group, um, a fellow member, and they gave me an award um, in 2020 for slaying my life. No, I actually love the community, that's why. Um, then I actually, when I was in Thailand, I led um, PyCon Thailand and uh, PyCon APEC 2021. And then I founded PyLadies uh, Bangkok and also the web design in PyCon US from 2022 till next year. It's um, part of my creation and the team. Um, then actually I started not with PyCon and Python, but um, I started organizing um, Ruby Tuesday no booze, <laughs> no booze. So, well, um, that's how it started. And then um, eventually it turned on um, really successful and started the very first RubyConf then and organized a couple of code wars. But my full-time jo job is managing a group of um, maybe, I would say more than 80 designers in a Ukrainian startup called Osomic. And, um, now, what really pulls me away from Ruby to Python is the community. It's not, on, it's not the language, I mean the language too, both, but the community, boy, the community in Python, it's amazing. You know how many groups you can find around the world I mean, around the world, you can find in every country a Python related community where you can join to learn something. You have questions, it, the support everywhere, it's open source. You ask anyone on the line, they will reply and help you. Even if they don't know, they'll try their best to help you to solve some problems that you have. Yeah, I see some faces. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's a little bit slower, but well, it's open source, so that's the reason why. And it's really active. 
and really active and accessible. And that's why I meet a lot of uh, interesting people, including those that I see here for the first time after like online with all the faces. And we managed to, there's also three other ladies here, Marietta, which is um, the PyCon chair, US, uh, PyCon US chair this year and next year. Teresa, who is the organizer, where is she? Oh, yeah, there. And Chuck, who um, has been really active in EuroPython and um, a lot of, I mean, Chuck is like the global runner around every PyCon events. So we know that um, we talk about indifferences and the, um, the talks of like female not being shown in a group, uh, not speaking enough, not showing on the, on the list of uh, the talks and the speakers, but good news, it has already changed. So over the years, we can see this is already only 2016. Now we are in 2023. It has actually proven to have improved uh, intensively, and you can see the the line just going up and up, and it's almost um, the same. I would be interested to um, update this, but because of my work right now, I don't have really time to update. Um, but Jessica in 2016 actually um, did a research on that. Um, so we was talking about that, and Chuck was saying, like, what about talk podcast? Like, we we love to listen to podcast. Like everyone, like. It's, it's kind of like, even sometimes when I do workout, I like to just listen to podcasts instead of music. So what about that? Can, can we actually um, know something else? And we said, is there any... Um, so Marietta was saying, hmm, I got a feeling that there's not really that many female speakers on, in a podcast. And she was like, you know what? We are not going to presume. Let's just do some data research to see whether we can get something out from this. So out of curiosity, Marietta searched the keyword Python podcast using Bing, Google, DuckDuckGo. And um, we have a criteria of over 100 episodes. And um, these are the top three. How many of you have um, heard at least one episode from there? Hmm, OK. So that's real Python podcast, it's Python Bytes, and uh, talk Python to me. And of this, Marietta, as usual, love to code and figure out so, um, how to make good use of all this data using a beautiful scope library and some Python script. Use all this criteria, the name of the guest, date of the episode, episode number, podcast title, and um, sponsor if there's any. And what happened is that out of 666 episodes, only 170 were featured, um, were female speakers, female um, invited guests, which is 17.56. And this 117 actually do have repeated speakers, which means that it's actually lesser. And the reality is actually 96. So, um, if you want more details on how, how we get those numbers, you can scan it um, on this QR code, um, which um, we took from, um, we, we actually added on dataset where you can actually try to check and um, turn up the data yourself here, all right? So let's look at that in chart. So if you actually put it in, <laughs> terms of 32 teeth of an adult, given the fact that there's top and bottom teeth, this is the amount of gaps that we have. So how are we going to solve this? Well, are we actually short of um, Pythonistas, female Pythonistas? I think we do have quite a bit here. So what did I do is that last night I started um, pulling out the number of uh, Pi Ladies chapters in uh, around the world, and I have trouble putting everything on one page. There was over 250 chapters around the world. 
which means if we actually take just one, one single speaker from one chapter, that's 250 speakers that you have, which is equals to 250 episodes or four conferences that you can lead. <laughs> so that's why we said, you know what? Let's do it ourselves. And that's where we come out with this um, new podcast called The Hidden Figures of Python uh, for the underrepresented groups. So this underrepresented group doesn't mean that it's only for women, but also for um, other un underrepresented groups like the LGBTQ and um, also like um, different race and um, different countries. So we're trying to pull all these people together to not only talk about the knowledge, but also the experience and the success stories because we feel that we need role models that we can relate to so that we can actually say, oh, this, this speaks to me. If they can do it, I can do it. Something is wrong with the video. <laughs> it was cut differently from what it was. <laughs> anyway, if you are interested to listen to um, the podcast that we just finished um, recording about three days ago, uh, we have actually about five or six um, speakers um, in line already. So you can follow us at uh, PyPodcasts podcasts, meow, uh, dot live. So if you want to write to us, you can write at meow at pipodcasts.lab. That's about it, folks. <laughs> Do you just raise your hand? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. We're done with the conference, right? Almost, 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 almost. Okay. Now we have lightning talks, and then hmm? people want the five minutes break before we start with the lightning talks. That's totally fine. But I will first tell you what the monk said. <laughs> okay. So, so the monk tells the man, you know, what that noise was about that they heard. He heard this morning. And the man says, wow, <laughs> that's so insane. And then the question that I have here in the room, did anybody, so everybody here wanted to become a monk, some people or a monkey, but did anybody actually succeed at that? <laughs> no, so I'm really sorry, but I cannot tell you because none of you are a monk. <laughs> so please go on your break. <laughs> yeah, but five minutes, please, because- Five minutes, really short, uh, yeah, like, and. Yeah. And if you decide by the next Python pizza to become a monk and succeed at it, do let us know and we can tell you.
Like action. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Meili, and I will talk to you about when low tech meets high tech. Disclaimer: I woke up at five to come here. I'm very tired, and maybe my brain will just blank out. So this is a topic I was introduced. <coughs> I will tell you. It's about the talk is about USSD and Brandenburg. So what is this USSD? This is USSD is something that. I will explain. And Brandenburg is this huge green area around Berlin that, uh, yeah, it's vastly empty. But <laughs> talk about it later. So what is this USSD thing? It's uh, actually unstructured supplementary service data. So I don't know if you have ever seen this, hey, type this uh, hash, blah, 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 uh, star thing to check your balance with the phone number or to do this other thing. Oh, the analysis is terrible. Uh, but I don't know, have you seen this ever? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, yeah, it's a kind of very basic technology with not such a great UI, but it's actually very useful in some cases. In my company, it's uh, doing, uh, it's called Wave and we are doing mobile money for African countries. And in many places, the internet connectivity is really low. So it's actually a great way to, to give uh, very high-end services like send money to somebody, make, uh, a deposit or or a withdraw just by sending few few bits of uh, information so it's super reliable in that sense and uh, very low bandwidth is necessary so yeah the ui is really terrible but it's really great for uh, low connectivity cases and where does brandenburg come in so <laughs> actually <laughs> I, I don't know if you have ever been in brandenburg but yeah if you don't know the area and you're driving you are like okay may God help me or I just stop and ask because, yeah, internet abandons you. And I, I had had some friends that actually rented the car in Berlin. Uh, they got the car with the app, you know, you share, uh, get the, the car, you go to the nice lake in Brandenburg and then you want to go home. And then guess what? <laughs> it's not working. No connectivity, not for you, not for the car. You are in the middle of nowhere and no way to go back. But if they had implemented USSD for the car and for the phone, it would have worked. It's a business idea, take it. It's, I'm offering it freely. And uh, yeah, a bit of how it looks like. You are actually have the user talking to the telco, which is like the, the service, uh, whatever is the company. And then you just implement a service that is what the telecommunication provider expects, which can be a bit different for each one. And that's it, and it works. You can plug in whatever you want behind. Thank you for listening. And. Uh, no more stories now because you all know what the end so Hey everyone, I want to talk uh, today about a Python script I wrote to automatically track the hours I bill when I am invoicing. So I'm a contractor and I didn't find any really good, um, really any solutions to this, so I made my own. Um, so there's this software called Activity Watch, which is open source, uh, good for, with your data, and it can do cool things like you can visualize uh, different things that you worked on and it shows like all these time timing bins and you can export it as a weird JSON file, but that's not particularly useful because I need to track my own data with uh, invoicing. And so in order to do that, you see the little dollar sign, I need to actually give it like, this is the category, this is when I worked. So my Python script is this open source code base I made. Um, it's called Quackify Automation. I'm showing it so people can mess around with it. Maybe if you're a contractor and you wanted to not have to like log your hours very carefully. Um, the way that the activity watch works is it takes your window title and then it um, pulls pulls in the um, it pulls in the data and then it does a regular expression match on the data itself um, for the window title. And so this is how you can aggregate different. Um, types of events in, in your, on your laptop. And so essentially what my script does is I can walk through and I actually integrated this also into Google Calendar. So those can also be categorized. 
So it's like an efficient way to uh, take all of this data and then upload it directly into a, a software called Clockify, which um, yeah lets me bill my invoices. I also make made a uh, way to export and create an actual PDF for, for the invoice. Um, yeah, so just like a quick walkthrough of the of the running through. You, you can set a custom time range. You can set the month of interest. You can um, yeah, show a list of project IDs, et cetera, and then uh, yeah, classify using the different numbers sorted by how much time you spend on the different invoices. Um, so yeah, check it out if you're interested. Um, and that's that's everything I had for my lightning talk. Open no, no, it's called bad news. It's in the folder. Which folder is that? The speaker, the speaker folder. I don't have access to it, but maybe Christian put it here. Ah, oh, yes, you put the link. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. It's a PDF again? Yes, it's again. So, yeah, that's it. Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's the right yeah. one. So now we're going to end the day with some bad news. No? No, there's, no, no there's enough. No. I'm kidding. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, I have some bad news to share. Uh, you remember Python, 16 million users worldwide. Uh, Excel brings another 70, 50 million users. Python dominance uses worldwide. It has been all pointed out to me to from Arthur, actually, that I have some bad news because uh, there's 5 billion people using browsers and you can run JavaScript in the <laughs> browser console like this here. So actually, uh, browsers enable 5 billion <laughs> users to use JavaScript. So uh, actually, we have now JavaScript dominance, five billion users worldwide. I'm very sorry, but sorry, but 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 sorry, but we have smart people in this room. And have you ever heard of PyScript? Because you can run Python in the browser. And Antonio actually just a few minutes ago wrote me this, so you can run Python. And we are able to find two people in the world who use Excel, but not a browser. So Python is in the lead by two people again. <laughs> And that's, I think, the good news. There's two people. I have more good news because who knows this building? That's the BCC Berlin. Yes. Uh, this is how it looks inside. This is the organizers from last year on stage uh, in the opening session. I'm really proud to announce PyCon and PyData Berlin 2024, 22nd uh, or to 24th of April at the BCC. We have a 10 years birthday to celebrate, actually. Like, it's 10 years PyData Berlin. It was a satellite conference. Yeah, woo, it was a satellite conference from EuroPython then, which was run by the PyCon DE time at the time. It was my first EuroPython, and it was also the, where I first signed up for do anything in a community. And yeah, yeah see where it got me. Um, yes, and if you want to sign up newsletter, we have um, a newsletter on uh, our page, so you can get notified. The CFP and everything will open by the end of the month, and that's two minutes. Thank you very much. And now, last but not least, because after this, we will start the next conference, right? <laughs> no? no. Sorry, one? I signed up late. It would have been a perfect ending. And <laughs> I, I just took the break to sneak in. <laughs> This one here, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's only two minutes. Wait a second, I need to change this. Oh, it's actually working. Okay. But you might have to click on the stairs. Right side. Yeah, just click there. Yeah, this song is here. Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, so, so this is about a script that I wrote. This is our schedule, uh, it's just some file, a CSV file. Um, and this is PowerPoint karaoke. So Visidata is a tabular exploration tool. Um, 
uh, you can look at the CSV file like this. And I always forget how to use it. So I wrote a feature for, for this visit data thing. You should check out visit data, but I just talked about the feature. So who, who, about, who knows about fuzzy finding, FZF? Yeah, it's a like it's it's fuzzy finder, so you can you can um, type just whatever and find lines uh, with this tool. And I it's written in Go, so um, if you if you like fuzzy finding and don't like Go, then now is your chance to steal something from the visit data source code. Uh, so what what's happening here? Yeah, first we see like the fuzzy finding algorithm in Go. And um, yeah, you can. It's open source, so you can download it um, and check it out. Um, and that's what I did. Um, so I had like go side by side with my Python file, and I, I basically verbatim copied over everything to Python and tried to use every every command. So I just stole it very deliberately. Um, and I mean, I also referenced the the fuzzy match. So to be fair, and you can check the source code out and see it from, from this Python source code. And the way it helps you is like with this command finder. So this is like the implementation. So fuzzy finding helps you find commands. So when you use the when, when you use the uh, visit data the first time, you can now sort and you can um, you can do like resize, for example. Uh, and then this this is the like little feature that I built like recently was my last touch with Python, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. The conference, then we have a Wait, what do we do now? Ah. <laughs> I do the last slides or not? The closing yeah. conference close is there in the five on the five. Oh nice. See? My brain stopped working. It's a PDF now? You started also with the PDFs? Yes, I like PDFs. <sighs> <laughs> it's like it's an invasion. Okay, so hmm, wait a sec. No, it's disappointing. There's one way to do it. Getting there. Everybody's so patient today. This Must have much. this is the skills that you learn from trying to become a monk. <laughs> Could be. Monastery. Yeah. yeah. So we've been working for this conference really closely with Apple and their new upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Closing, we have some conference announcements. Yeah. So here are some organizers. Just a second. Just to make sure that people are seeing. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Maria Jose. I am one of the co organizers of the Five Ladies Con. It's a conference that's going to happen uh, in December, next month. Uh, here we have some other co organizers also there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a Two days conference. It's online, mm -hmm. hundred percent online. It will be twenty-four hours. Yep, six different languages, three different, <laughs> and, and we're cover three different time zones. America's in the in APAC, and we're gonna have six keynotes, forty-five speakers around the world, all together mm -hmm. uh, talking about Python. Yeah, uh, it's an event online. Is free, and we encourage you to join us. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, if you have insomnia or something, you can cover. You can be <laughs> in <laughs> different time zones and learn together. It's a single track, so um, you don't have to hop around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. You stay here. You stay. And another conference. And another conference. Oh, yeah. And you are coming in too. Uh, Python US, yep. the biggest conference in the universe, I heard. 
God Python. So Some including Mars. <laughs> <laughs> so the only thing that I wanted to highlight is that uh, the CFP still is open until the 18th of December, and you can yep. propose talks. Posters, posters, tutorials, tutorials. charlats, which is talks in Spanish. Yes, there's a mm -hmm. special Spanish uh, track if someone speaks Spanish, and also some mentorships. So, and magic shows if you want to. There is <laughs> along the side of the conference, if you had enough, there's also open spaces. Mm -hmm. So people organize like six additional tracks sometimes mm -hmm. yeah. filled with activities of yeah. how you can. I cannot list you all the topics because yeah. there's like one. Million of uh, I think things. a lot of people try like all sorts because anything that does not fall into all these categories goes into this open space. So there are people who actually say, like, you know what, we are tired, let's do a yoga class. And someone actually did that. So yeah, yeah that's uh that's the cool part about open spaces. You can discuss anything under the sky. Uh, please, if financial if your financial situation is not like oh yes, come buy and pay for everything. Mm -hmm. There are lots of grants. Yep, covering flights and hotel mm -hmm. for people. Yep. If you're a speaker there, high chances as usual. But uh, yep. in general, I have met many people that had not even a talk there mm -hmm. and were there with the flight and hotel cover. So yep. please do not make this a uh, stopping factor for your trip. As yep. long as you have a passport, you can yep. go to the US. It's gonna happen. Um, be happening in May. So uh, in uh, Pittsburgh, yeah. so it's a really cool city. I I went there um, this summer, and um, you can you can just scout around the area, and it's so um, easy to move around. So I think um, encourage everyone to sign up to yep. um, be part of um, this uh, PyCon US. Yeah. Sure. I just wanted to add something about it. If anybody wants to submit a workshop, though, like, you know, like all the pie ladies who are doing workshops or sometimes the workshops are paid. Right. Yeah. So whereas you're not getting so paid to give a talk, but for a workshop, you get actually paid. OK, that's okay. it with uh, PyCon US. And the next one. We heard we heard that you wanted to get more pizza. Yes. So hello everyone, my name is Mia, I'm based in Prague, Czech Republic, and I'm organizing Prague meetups, PyCon CZ conference, and also for the first time in history, we will have pizza in Prague. It will be held in February on 24th, and also we have calls for proposals open, so in case you would like to repeat your talk, or if, if you would like to try to give a talk, uh, you could visit Prague in February and attend our pizza event. Thank you. This is already old news. Yeah, so everyone knows about Python D already. So Alexander, news, that's bad news and old news. Alexander, <laughs> this is old news, but you, yeah, Sorry. but you have to do it differently now to make it. Oh, I have to make it differently. You cannot say uh, the same thing. Don't say the same thing. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> there is a big gathering of a great community. <laughs> in a, a city uh, which is the capital of Germany and uh, it's really worthwhile to go there. It's a diverse crowd, we, there's great talks and uh, we will um, launch the conference uh, seven, uh, no, uh, yeah, nine days before May and it will run for three days. So I think, yes, and yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. So, what what do you what do we do in the talk? Do we have? I oh, know you do we it. We have slides. So, so now, close, ah, I thought you do the dance. No, we have a train. You don't want to do the dance? No. Thirty thirty <laughs> slides. The pizza dance. The now pizza. they will. Thirty slides. We have thirty slides that okay, just for the closing slides. of the conference. So we are doing the slides now. No, we are no, going no, to no no. <laughs> so the idea is that we have a lot of pizza left, and in order to build up some appetite for the pizza, we are going to. Mm make the conference a little bit longer <laughs> we are keeping everybody hmm? no pizza and now kristen no, is doing I the dance not, i will not dance <laughs> that's really tomorrow important. if you're in town tomorrow and you want to now you've been totally inspired we talked about it sign up to go to this conference training for public speaking for women in tech so qr code sign up and you get a free ticket it's also on social media, so don't worry. Otherwise, you could go sightseeing, but it's Hamburg, and it's probably going to be raining a bit. Oh. And it's 
Yeah, really cold, so humid. If you don't have clothes for sightseeing, then go indoors. And thanks again to all our sponsors. Yeah. And do we have anything else? Oh yeah, and the organizers. Christian and Jessica. And Anne Marie. Anne Marie couldn't join today, but she is online, so I hope that she is good yeah. health. Thanks, Anne Marie. And Christian is going to do the dance next time. Next time. <laughs> and yeah. a special thanks for awesome. to, to Teresa because yeah. she did most of the heavy lifting of the conference. So I know, I just thank did you very media. much for doing that. And then, yeah, so we're going to be on YouTube um, with all the other Python pizzas on the same YouTube. So watch the stream. It's, it's live. So in case you want to watch some of the talks over and over again, do so, yeah, on the way back to your cave and your mountain and to the monks, you know, just, you know. But you need to eat pizza while you're watching. Yes, that's the, exactly. The so that's the challenge. And, okay, now. I will not dance. When you... <laughs> what are you talking about? No. You got the swag, cookie cutters. When you do use them for the first time, take a picture and put it on whatever social media and tag it with Python Pizza Hamburg so that, you know, people don't forget that it's really tasty to code in Python. So and that's it. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. No more slides. Okay. I will. Bye.